Live from Tampa, Florida, here are Amy Walter and David Chalian. Hello and welcome to Tampa Bay. We are joining you live and you are joining us live, of course, here at the Tampa Bay Times Forum in Tampa, Florida, where we are joining the Republican National Convention for 2012. It's officially day two, but it is only beginning. Today was the day where Mitt Romney officially was nominated. He gained enough delegates to officially be nominated for the Republican presidential uh, well, to be the Republican presidential nominee, he has to accept that, which he will do on Thursday. But for now, it has been a long road to get to Tampa. Mitt Romney has a day where he can just bask in the glow of getting those delegate votes he fought so hard and spent so much money to get. And what a night it is going to be to kick off. Um, there are lots of great speakers, but we want to tell you how excited we are uh, that you're joining us and that you're going to be with us for the next three nights for this great live stream coverage. We're bringing you four and a half hours every night of nonstop coverage, and we want you to be a part of it. So please tweet us. Uh, use the hashtag 2012GOP. Uh, send us your questions. We'll try to incorporate them in what we're asking our guests. We've got some great guests lined up, big newsmakers, ABC personalities and journalists, Yahoo News personalities and journalists will be here uh, as well. And and um, we also, if you are watching this on Yahoo right now, you see right below us, there's that live blog going. Um, make sure to join that conversation as well. We're going to bring what's happening there in the live blog I into this uh, live stream show as well. We have so much fun stuff. We're going to have our guests sign in on an iPad, and we'll have a whole photo slideshow on abcnews.com. Um, we're going to give you sort of the best social sentiment, what's happening on Twitter, the social conversation around some of the big moments that are happening in this convention hall. It's a convention like never before, largely due uh, to social media. Right. It's really an, uh, an amazing uh, thing that they've built here. But as we know, we should say, uh, this is not the biggest story that's happening right now, and the Romney campaign all day long has been having to tell reporters like us, badgering them with questions, how are you dealing with this storm that is headed to the Gulf Coast uh, at a time where you want to have a big celebration on this floor, and clearly uh, these winds have kicked up, we've got Hurricane Isaac, and so we want to give you guys the very latest on what's happening in the Gulf, and for that we turn to ABC News meteorologist Ginger Z, who's in Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, Ginger, can you give us the latest now that Isaac is actually a hurricane and when we expect it uh, to do its damage? Yes, Category 1 hurricane, so 80 mile per hour winds. It is still off the coast, the center of it, away from New Orleans, but it looks like that is where it is going to make that hit. Overnight tonight into early tomorrow is really going to be the worst of the winds and the storm surge, but then the flooding will last for days and it's going to continue north into places as far north as St. Louis, southern Illinois, parts of Indiana, and then kind of make a curve to the east. Beyond that, though, we have to focus on what's happening right here, and there is a 450 mile stretch of coastline along this Gulf of Mexico that is dealing with just what I'm standing in right now. Really heavy rains, flooding already, and strong surf. See this? We anticipate that that strong storm surge is going to come up and over, cover this beach easily here in Gulfport. Parts of Highway 90 that is right in front of me already shut down in Biloxi, and I'm seeing reports all the way from the Florida Panhandle that things are really beginning to get rough. And Ginger, if you can tell us a little bit about what you're hearing from the people who live there, what are they doing and what are they feeling? What's, what's the sentiment out there? You know, I covered Hurricane Katrina here seven years ago tomorrow, and there is a level of anxiety that is very high from the people, but it's also an understanding. They want folks to remember them in Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. It's not just Louisiana is what they say, and they have done everything they can to get ready for this storm. Boarded up buildings up and down the roadways. People have left. There's a mandatory curfew that goes into effect here in Gulfport later tonight, and we're really hearing police up and down the street saying, Please get off the beaches, get out of the water. This is not the place to just come and look. The storm is here and it's only going to get worse. And just give us a quick look ahead. Where does it go next? And how long do we think we're gonna see pictures like the, the images right behind you? 
Well, here's the thing. Tonight into early tomorrow is this strong wind stuff and the driving rain. Then the flooding's going to take over and slowly, I mean Isaac, is going to slow down, sit over parts of Louisiana and slowly make its way north into the heartland. There is that little sweetness at the end of this storm because some places need it. That drought-ridden area along the Mississippi will get some much-needed rain. But until then, it is going to be a really hairy 24 hours from now. Ginger Z, ABC meteorologist, thank you very much for that update. We appreciate it. And Amy, you can tell as the band, uh, the music starts striking up here, uh, this whole notion, this this tricky uh, split screen of a party going on here, while clearly uh, everyone's still very concerned about the residents along the Gulf Coast. That's right. Well, we're going to take a look now on the other side of the split screen now and go to our colleague David Muir who's down on the floor. David Muir of course covers the Romney campaign. He's been with them now for the last couple of days up in Boston. David, what can you tell us about the preparations that Ann Romney and Mitt Romney have been making for this night? Yeah. Amy, it's a fine line they have to walk here tonight because of the other story that you began your program with. And, of course, that's the hurricane barreling towards the Gulf. Imagine being the Romney campaign and having to watch this and change their schedule over the last couple of days. Obviously, the convention now smaller than they had planned, fewer days, but they're going to squeeze in exactly what they had hoped to accomplish. And one of those goals comes front and center tonight. Ann Romney, as you know, Amy and David, uh, one of the key numbers that the Romney campaign continues to look at uh, are where they're polling among women in this country. And, and the most recent ABC News Washington Post poll uh, had some numbers about favorability ratings and, and where women stood in America. Uh, more find him unfavorable than do favorable. And so tonight is a huge opportunity, they, they believe, with this sort of primetime appeal of Ann Romney to tell her story, offer a more personal side of him, hope to make him more likable to voters who perhaps don't know about him who haven't tuned in to the presidential race until now. We, we've received excerpts from the campaign just a short time ago. She's expected when she takes this stage here behind me to talk more about uh, the marriage. And she, she says in the excerpts that we have looked at that many people think of uh, our marriage and talking about her marriage with Mitt as a storybook marriage. And she said in storybooks they don't talk about breast cancer or MS. And she, she'll make the point that theirs is not a storybook marriage but a real marriage. I, I think that's a real attempt to try to make them relatable to many of the people in the country who so far uh, might not be sold yet on Mitt Romney's candidacy and in a presidential race that's a dead heat right now, if they can convince people and bring some women over to their side, they're convinced they might be able to pull this off in November. David, Amy? Thank you so much, David. I hope you can still hear me. I will try to shout a question to you here, but do you have a sense? Mitt, Mitt Romney gives lots of speeches to crowds like this, and Romney, not as much. Butterflies, nervousness, uh, this is a real unique experience for her. It's really unique, David. Uh, you know, I've been spending the last couple of days uh, very close uh, with the campaign. Flew in with Ann Romney on the plane today, coming from Belmont, obviously, into Tampa. She came to the back of the plane with her um, sort of famous Welsh cakes now. It's her grandmother's recipe. Uh, she was back in her Belmont kitchen yesterday baking them. She brought cases of them with her down to Tampa. She stopped by the broadcast location, gave uh, some to Diane Sawyer earlier uh, this afternoon, gave them out on the plane. I did do some taste testing. They're actually pretty good, i got to tell you. She she said she's perfected the recipe over the years. But, you know, Ann Romney is very honest. She, she was talking on the plane about how she had practiced the last couple of days in New Hampshire inside a high school auditorium, and, and she had, did so with teleprompters set up. And she said, quite frankly, I haven't used a teleprompter before. I don't like it. And she said on the plane today, we'll see how it goes tonight. So I think if she can keep that sort of relatability going, get up there on that stage, uh, be very normal, not someone who is uh, remarkably rehearsed or practiced with a teleprompter, it might actually have a, a great deal of appeal. And, and as you mentioned, it's the first time we'll really be hearing from her in a setting like this as she uh, makes the sell to the American people that her husband is far more than the Mitt Romney that they might know that he's her husband, he's a father, and of course a grandfather to a, a very large and a very proud family, given the fact that he was officially nominated here today in Tampa. Yes. Well, thank you, David Muir. We can't wait to hear from you mo much more as we move on through the campaign and get your perspective on the Ann Romney speech. And now we're joined by somebody else who's paying a lot of attention to this election, Tim Phillips from Americans for Prosperity Spending. This is an outside group. You're a right. 401C4, which is officially a nonprofit organization. Right. You like Republicans, though. They're you spend a lot of time. They're, they're certainly better on the economic issues that matter to us. You bet.
you were spending a lot, a great deal of money uh, on this election, trying right. to encourage people to vote for many of these Republicans. One overarching theme that we hear from this hall, and we've been hearing throughout this campaign, is people don't like Barack Obama, but they don't yet love Mitt Romney. Right. So what is it that Mitt Romney needs to do, and what can groups like yours do to take those undecided voters who can't quite figure out who right. Mitt Romney is and push them over the top? I think the, the job we're doing, and we're expressly advocating the defeat of President Obama for president. I know in the ads that we're doing right now, reaching out to these swing voters, they don't want to hear traditional political messages. They genuinely want to hear uh, about the issues that matter most to them, and that's the economy for them. And so our ads very specifically stay away from the typical political grandstanding, the ominous music, the voice of God announcer, all that stuff. It's not working. We use the actual interviews with folks who voted for Obama four years ago, and they just simply, in their own words, unscripted, talk about why they've switched and they're not voting for him this year. So that's what we're doing. And our job, frankly, is to, to focus on the president's record, and that's what these ads do. With regard to Governor Romney, I think his job is to personalize himself this week. I think folks like are uneasy with the president's policies. They just aren't comfortable yet with Governor Romney. And I think he'll accomplish that. And I think Mrs. Romney is going to go a long way toward that tonight. Uh, back to the advertising, though, that you're, I mean, you're one of many outside right. groups that are out there. The campaigns are spending a ton. Right. We are at such a saturation level. I in August, it feels like the end of October. <laughs> I mean, That's it's true. It, it is a really intense period of time of advertising. Is it? Total saturation that voters are, are beginning to tune out the ads? No, that's always a concern, and you hear that kind of on a yearly basis, but I, I don't think so. Uh, typically, voters sift through the information, and they don't like political-looking and sounding messages this year. They just don't. Certainly, the swing voters don't. Now, partisans on the left and right enjoy the red meat and the clubbing ads, but I'm telling you, the swing voters, and they're only about 9 to 12 percent of the electorate left, they genuinely don't like the political stuff. They don't like the name calling. They don't like the, you know, the, the, the political ease. They really want to hear uh, about the issues that matter to them, and that's what we're doing. I think most groups are doing that, at least the ones that know what they're doing are. Now, you all have been something of a punching bag, too. That's um, right. That that's right. Democrats but do love to point to your group. The Koch brothers are, right. are major funders to you all. Um, do you think you can still be an effective messenger as an outside group if voters keep hearing these messages about these outside groups right. and how terrible they are and we hate them and they're spending right. all this special interest money? What, what do you hear from voters about the ads that when they, of yours when they I see I know this? you're surprised to hear this, but we've studied that. We've yeah. swing voters. <laughs> really? I know you're stunned. There is. We have done that. And what we find is that swing voters don't care about process. They just don't. Unless there's corruption or illegality. You know, that's different. I mean process from a standard uh, political or, 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 or such. They just don't care about it. They're focused on the issues. So, you know, years ago... George Soros was a big punching bag. Remember that? The yeah, right would beat up on Mr. Soros. And, and voters, again, in the middle didn't care. They want to know, are these policies uh, then in the Bush administration good or bad? This time, voters don't really care who David Koch is. They don't care who, you know, all the, the punching Mr. Adelson or the other punching bags that you hear so much that the left attacks good Americans, by the way. They want to know about these issues. And so it's a parlor game. For the politicos and the partisans, it's not reality for the average key swing voter. No doubt Mitt Romney has the mission you were talking about here at right. the convention and sort of getting the American people comfortable with him and right. introducing himself. But he also has to get to 270 electoral votes. You look at that map very closely where you decide where to advertise. Uh, what, are the, what are the two or three states you think are going to turn this election? I'm going to give you three states that not everyone talks about. Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin. We've been there for a long time in these states. Uh, we're there now with this advocacy effort. Uh, I'm telling you, those three states are going to come up, end up meeting more than maybe in Ohio or Pennsylvania. I know that's a little bit against counter conventional wisdom. Everyone says Ohio. Ohio is important. We're there as well, by the way. I'm telling you, watch Minnesota, Iowa. By the way, the president was in Iowa for a full day, day and a half. That's unusual. Those three states, watch those three states. We are just talking about the fact that the president is spending an awful lot of time in Iowa and an awful lot of money in Iowa. So yes. he's obviously seeing the same thing Those, that and, you are. And Minnesota has not been in play in two decades plus. It's in play. I'm telling you it is. All right. Tim Phillips of the Americans for Prosperity, thank you so much you for bet, joining Dave, us. We thank really you. appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. You bet. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we are now watching Speaker John Boehner come out to give his speech. Okay. We'll take him for a couple seconds here. Officially. Yes. Yes, Koki.
The answer, in my view, is obvious. You bet we can. You know, the American people are still asking the question, where are the jobs? But President Obama only offers excuses instead of answers. His record is a shadow of his rhetoric. Yet he has the nerve to say that he's moving us forward and the audacity to hope that we're going to believe him. Allow me to illustrate. You know, I'm what you'd call a regular guy with a big job. I've got 11 brothers and sisters and my dad and my uncles owned a bar in Cincinnati. I worked there growing up, mopping floors, waiting tables, tending bar. So believe me when I say I learned how to deal with every character who walked in the door. So let's say right now some guy walked into our bar full of guys looking for work, having a tough go of it, and the guy said, well, the private sector is doing fine. Well, you know what we do? That's right, we throw them out. Think about this, a guy walked into our bar full of people paying more for health care, paying more for gas, paying more for everything, and this guy would say, well, we're better off than what we would have been. Well, you know what we do, we throw them out. Now, if a guy walked into our bar full of folks who couldn't tell, t couldn't tell you the last time they got a raise or their house was above water, and the guy said, well, we tried our economic plan and it worked. You know what we do. We throw them out. Now, let's say a guy walked into our bar and before he could say anything, he overheard a regular telling his story. Turns out this guy ran a small business, got involved in it while he was in school. Then, out of nowhere, his business partner died. They had just one customer. So he fought like hell through sleepless nights and close calls, and they made it, thank God. Paid their dues, proud of what they've managed to do. Now, if a guy walked into a bar and heard that story and he said, well, if you've got a business, you didn't build that. Well, you know what we do with him, don't you? We throw him out. By the way, that small business guy is my story. That was our business, and we did build that. But you know, it could have just as easily been the story of anyone who's built something from nothing. No guarantees, no government there to hold your hand, just a dream and the desire to do better. President Obama doesn't get this. He can't fix the economy because he doesn't know how it was built. So in 70 days, when the American people walk into the voting booth, what should we do? Should throw them out. <laughs> because we can do better, we can do a lot better. And it starts, out, starts with throwing out the politician who doesn't get it and electing a new president who does. That's All right. So there we have you know, Speaker Boehner riled up, building. of course, and of course, a man who likes to talk about his time as the son of a tavern owner making a lot of a man walks into a bar jokes, <laughs> which is not surprising at all. We're very happy, though, to be joined, Senator Orrin Hatch. Uh, first of all, congratulations well, on your nomination. You, you so made much. it through a very competitive primary. <laughs> yeah, we did. And, uh, and you did it. And, uh, and here you are now about to watch as one of your home state candidates, Mia Love, Mia Love mm -hmm. is about to uh, take the stage in a right. few minutes. Not your traditional uh, Republican candidate. Well, she's terrific. Well, for me, uh, uh, she, she is traditional. She's very conservative, very smart, very articulate, tough as nails, good mayor. She's a, she's a very, very fine person, and I think it's an uplift of the Republican Party to have somebody like me running for the House of Representatives. She'll, be, she'll do well. For, for those of you who don't know, she is African-American Mormon who's the mayor, right, of... Uh, yeah, she's, ha she's Haitian-American Haitian and, American. Uh, and uh, very proud of that yep. and married to a wonderful husband and has three, I think, three beautiful children. Uh, Senator Hatch, uh, listening to Speaker Boehner here, it reminds me that he's had quite, uh, across the Capitol from where you work, uh, right. he's had quite uh, the wild ride the last couple of years since he's become Speaker, trying right. to bring all those freshman members together, the Tea Party element that you were trying to fend off and you successfully did so uh, in your uh, primary this year. If Mitt Romney is elected president, 
is he going to have as difficult a, a time, uh, even more so, as president to sort of get the party all on one page to move his agenda forward? Well, there are a lot of good people in the Tea Party movement. And there are various factions of the Tea Party movement. Some of them aren't even Republicans, but the ones that are Republicans are really good people. They're just tired of, sick and tired of the spending, the borrowing, the taxing, the re over-regulatory nature of this administration. Frankly, this let's build the federal government at the cost of everything else. So I, I'm with them on, on those issues. But I think, uh, you know, Speaker Boehner is one of the best people I know. He's tough. He's smart. He comes from gra grassroots America. Uh, yeah, he's had some troubles, but he's also been able to do it. I have a real high regard for him. He's a good man. Let's talk a little bit uh, about the Senate, if indeed... Uh, you know, we're talking about compromise for a second. There's a lot of talk, though, that maybe Republicans can win outright the majority in the Senate. You want to talk us, to us a little bit about that? There's a big bump in the road, obviously, earlier this week. The Todd Akin uh, situation there in Missouri has a lot of Republicans wringing their hands saying that's a seat that we just basically gave back to the Democrats. I'd like to get your take on that race and then talk about what it means overall for, for taking control of the Senate. Well, Akin stepped in it. He shouldn't have said what he said. He's apologized profusely. But on the other hand, it was terrible what he said. Uh, I'm not writing off that race. I'm vice chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and I can tell you there are about 12 Democrat races that we have a chance on, and there's probably uh, six to eight that we have a real good chance on. Uh, I'd say they have a, uh, uh, that they claim that they, uh, they can defeat three of ours, and I'll, I'll bet on two of them without question. And I think, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a tough time, but hopefully we can take over the majority or at least uh, have it so close that we can really work, we have to work together for a change. <laughs> but we have no evidence to suggest that, that anybody in Washington is willing to work together. Oh, yeah, yes, you do. Now, there are a lot of people. I, I have Democrats come up to me and say, Senator, we need you back. You're one of the people who can help bring us together. And, and that doesn't mean bring it together on, on bad, in bad ways. Bring us together in a way that is you know, center right and where people can both hold their heads up high. You know, Republicans can't pass any bills without de some Democrats, and they can't really pass any without us. Uh, they did when they had 60 votes in the Senate. But uh, it's, uh, it's not as easy as you think. I just want to reflect a little bit on, on what just happened today, Mitt yeah. Romney being able to get over, get that 1144 vote. Um, he obviously had quite a competitive primary. There are lots of times when it looked like he wasn't going to make it. I'd just like you to reflect on what this primary meant for you and what you think it says about the Republican Party. There's still a lot of people saying that there's not the passion yet for Mitt Romney. Oh. There's a lot of passion against Barack Obama, but not yet for Mitt Romney. Well, there's both. Actually, uh, the passion for Mitt Romney is rising steadily as it should. He's one of the best people I know. You know, we know him better than anybody because when he came out to Utah, the Winter Olympics were $400 million in debt. We were, it looked like it was going to be the biggest eyesore in Olympic history. He turned that all around. We had the best Winter Olympics in history, and we wound up with a uh, $100 million surplus to take care of the venues. Then he became governor of Massachusetts. They were $3 billion in debt. They were going into real problems. He turned that around, balanced the budget four years in a row, even though he had a state legislature, 85% opposed to almost everything he did. By any measure, this guy's a real, real leader, and he does understand where jobs come from. He does understand how important a small business community is. He does understand how great America really can be. I think the more people get to know him, plus he ha he's lived a very good life. He and his wife are terrific human beings. The five boys are really something special. They're all very good people. I think the American people are going to learn to love him just like they learned to love Ronald Reagan. Senator Orrin Hatch, Republican of Utah, thank you very much for being with us. Great really to see you. Thank you for coming by. Great I really appreciate you. it. Take care. Thank and, you. And uh, Senator Hatch actually signed in in our uh, iPad uh, guest sign-in book. We're going to take photos of all our guests signing <laughs> in, and uh, we're going to post them in a slideshow on abcnews.com and uh, elsewhere, so you'll catch them on Yahoo, too. Thanks so That's much. That's great. Good to yeah. see you. As Amy and I were discussing earlier, it, it, it has been a long road for Mitt Romney. In fact, years, actually. But it has been a very long road to this moment of going over the top, getting this nomination. ABC's Dan Klepler has put together a look at uh, how Mitt Romney got from there to here. June 2011. Mitt Romney launches headfirst into his second pursuit of the presidency. And while it was one of those picture-perfect, perfect hair day kind of starts to the campaign, it's been an uphill climb to get the nomination. 
With a diverse field of candidates battling for 1,144 delegates, the Romney campaign got good and chalky to secure a firm grip in the race. Romney's first big ascent came from a win in Iowa, which turned into a, a slight slip when Hawkeye State voters determined that they liked Rick Santorum just a smidge more. Game on. The former Massachusetts governor got a grip on the Granite State, where he beat John Huntsman and Ron Paul for a win in the first in the nation primary. But in South Carolina, Mitt lost his footing when he lost to New Gingrich. With a little peroxide and a lot of cash, Camp Romney cleaned up those scrapes and blew past Gingrich in Florida. The trek gave almost everyone a chance at being a leader on the trail. Almost everyone. Rick, it's too damn hot. Rick Santorum's sweater vest kept him warm in the Midwest and the South, but it got caught on a snag in his home state of Pennsylvania. Santorum unclipped his carabiner and dropped from the race. With all series contenders back at base camp, Romney was fueling up with a record amount of campaign cash, but he got his lines tangled over negative ads and questions about his personal finances. Every year I've paid at least 13%. A little sweaty, but hydrated with enough delegates to win the nomination, Team Romney harnessed the power of Paul Ryan as the number two on the ticket. Now, with November 6th perched atop the summit, Romney and Ryan are hoping to gain height with voters and set up camp at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Dan Kleffler, ABC News. Well, that was, an, that was an impressive feat by Dan there. I, we are not doing any rock climbing here, right? Thank God, no. I've it been told be a, there will be... It would be really bad if we did. I'm told there will be no math and no rock climbing. <laughs> okay, so we have a little something different now. We went from politicians to somebody who... You've been on stage, but I don't know that you've given many s speeches in that same way. This is Jack Blades. For those of you, like me, who grew up in the 80s... You may recognize this man. You actually grew Ranger. up in the 80s, did you? Y yes. <laughs> did you call that growing up? There's some. Um, Amy, a yes. tell me the truth. It is very true. I really was 1985 who wasn't singing Sister Christian. Uh, Everyone I know was. We all were singing Sister Christian. We all were singing it, and that was you. And now here Thanks you are. That. Thanks yeah. for doing that. It's, right. I still have the image of the video in my brain. I will never forget it. But to think that 25 years later, here I am with you at the Republican National Convention. I never would have guessed that. I know, so I, how, how did this happen and how did you become, basically you're a Romney surrogate now. Well, I mean, I, I mean I'm a registered American is what I am, you know what I mean? And it just so, sort of happened, it shocked me too because I, I, I did, um, I did um, a Hannity show and then I, I got a call and someone said, hey, would you like to play a song at the convention? And I said, I'd love to. I mean, all my life, I grew up, you know, I mean, since I was a little kid, like 1964, watching these, you know, watching Sam Donaldson report, report on these, like, you know, conventions. It's like unbelievable, all the stuff that was on. And when they asked me, would you like to come and do something like this? I said, sure, I think it'd be great. So I came down here, I'm doing a song off my solo record. Called Back in the Game. Called Back in the Game. That's right. That's but right. was that written specifically for this purpose? No. It was no, 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 okay. no, no. It was out a couple months ago, yeah. Most people don't think rock star Republican. No, like, right? That's, is that an incongruous thing there? Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? I am who I am, and I, I'm wh what I, the way I've been all my life. So I don't, I, don't, I don't look at it this way. I look at it like, who's got the best idea? You have a good idea, I'm with you. You have a good idea, I'm with you. You know, and I go around, I tour all over the country all the time. And you know what? People are out there sometimes just going, and they're seeing politicians talking. And you know what they say? They, it's like they're saying, huh? Huh? H U H? Huh? You know what I mean? So, I'm I'm a common sense kind of guy, and so that's kind of why I'm here, just checking it all out and enjoying it. So, what do you like about Mitt Romney specifically? When you say you're a, a, a individual person kind of guy, what is it about Mitt Romney? And you you talk to enough people out there. What are they telling you about how they feel about Mitt Romney, and you can convince them? 
to vote for him. Well, it's, it's, it's not something that, you know, I don't think it's anything that you can convince anybody because this country is the way it is. I think you just got to believe in yourself. You got to believe in the American dream. And you have to believe the American dream is still alive because that's basically what I've done. I mean, I, I was a pre-med student in college and I decided to quit in my fourth year to move to San Francisco and join a rock band, right? I mean, David, would your parents like go, are you out of your mind? <laughs> yeah. you no, know, I'm going to shoot you. You know what I mean? It's like, that, that's nuts. Yes. You know, that's absolutely nuts. But I follow my dream, you know? And, and, and what I see is that it's, it's amazing because people are really quite remarkable when they believe they can do things. You know what I mean? And I think that's what we just have to do is we have to believe, we have to believe that we can do things, you know? And that's kind of where I'm at in life. And in everything I do and everything I say. And so, I, you know, it's not a question of a Republican, a Democrat, you know, you know, this color, that color, that, that. It's not about that, man. It's about who you are inside and believing in something in yourself and, and just going for it. And that's kind of what I do. Jack Blades, good luck with the song. It's called Back in the Game. Thanks so much for joining us. We Thank really you, David. Thank you. And next you time, singing that. you're going to, can, can you do... Just one oh, bar come on. from it. What, motoring? Come on. Yeah, come on. Come on. Motoring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very okay. much, Thank Jack you. Blades. See you Appreciate guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks hey! for coming by. All Good right. to see you. All right. And now we have a very special moment from a convention pass for you guys. This is one right out of the vault. You're going to love it from 1972. Take a look. <laughs> One uh, prominent uh, backer of uh, President Nixon has been entertainer Sammy Davis Jr. Davis told ABC's David Schumacher in Washington tonight that he and other black celebrities had come under some heat in the black community for backing the president. Well, for most people, uh, the awareness that Sammy Davis Jr. was supporting President Nixon uh, came at the convention when you suddenly threw your arms around him. Now, was that all impulsive, or uh, had you thought long and hard before you decided you were for President Nixon? No, I... I had made my commitment to the president about two weeks prior to that, but I must tell you that the hug, which is the thing that shocked all of the world, it seems now. Including President Nixon, just <laughs> I think so. Uh, that was totally impulsive. It was based upon what he had said. You aren't going to buy Sammy Davis Jr. by inviting him to the White House. You're going to buy him by doing something for America. And that is what we were doing. And he had said something very kind, and I, I didn't know what else to do, and I just ran up and hugged him, because I'm that kind of a guy. I think people know that. At least I would like to think that most people know that. A signature? And now we are joined by Sam Donaldson, who is there with Sammy Davis Jr. hearing all about the hug of Richard Nixon. Do you remember that moment, I Sam? remember the hug, right. And you look at the expression on Richard Nixon's face. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a certain kind of grin. Hello, Amy. Hello, Hello. David. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Sam. We're happy to have you here. Um, so this is not 1972, no, obviously. No, no. And uh, But uh, what do you make of this event going on right now? Th th there's not a great deal of love that we're seeing from Mitt Romney from his party here just yet. Well, I've watched a lot of people be nominated, and of course I've never been in a convention where you didn't know who was going to be nominated. But I've seen a lot of excitement, and they've got Barry Goldwater, my lord, and all that. I thought the excitement here was vapid. I thought these delegates did what they needed to do and then went out and had a hot dog. So what does he need to do? I mean, does Mitt Romney win even if these folks aren't jumping up and down out of their seats? They're going to go and vote for him anyway, right? Yeah, and, and he may very well win, as you well know. Uh, I think that's why he put Paul Ryan on the ticket. I'm always wrong, Amy, I, <laughs> except when I listen to you and David. I thought he was going to, you know, Rob Portman, someone right. like that. And he decided he needed to consolidate his base. He needed to fire up his own base to put a guy on the ticket who, if anything, is farther to the right than he is. And so maybe it works. Sam, um, if indeed uh, Paul Ryan is all about the base, uh, and I think you were right that his pick was all about that, we keep hearing, though, we're going to hear so much this week that's going to try to appeal to the middle. Warm Mitt Romney up to those undecided, persuadable voters. Ann Romney's speech is going to be very targeted towards those women in the middle, in the suburbs. Um, and I think we're probably, I would suspect Paul Ryan's speech is not going to be all red meat for the base, but they're going to try to win that middle as well. well how do you go to the middle with that platform? Now, no one pay, pays attention to the platform, but how do you go to the middle? On women, on Hispanic Americans, I don't know how he does it. And I think, I don't think he's going to try to do it, frankly. I think he's going to win on his base and the fact that he is the alternative to someone who is not popular on the economy. 
but it's making it close because people like him. <laughs> so these conventions, every year we say, this one is going to be so much different than the one that held before. And yet, this doesn't look much different than 1972. Right. You still have delegates on the floor. You still have all this. Is there a time <laughs> and place for this that is now past? No, it's, a, it's an anachronism, really. I think the parties ought to be able to put their best foot forward at yep. a certain point, and I think television and radio and all the media should carry those speeches. To get to know Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. I mean, it's part of our process. If, if we decided well, we need the advertising, so forget it, I think it'd be very bad. But all these days and all these speeches from the candidate from the 16th district of you know, Utah... Uh, no one pays any attention to it. And so I think from that start, it's gone. But I'll tell you this. If they start tear gassing in the street like they did in Chicago in 68, I'll get excited again. <laughs> now, were you tear gassed in 1968? Oh, with the best of them. <laughs> you, were, you were out there. Now, did you know what was going on or did you get caught up in the melee? Well, I knew what was going on. The police and the protesters were having a riot. Right, right, right. It was, of course, in the official commission report called the police riot. And I was there also when... <laughs> Abe Ribicoff, the great senator and former HHS, HEW secretary, was on the podium and Mayor Daley pointed the finger at him and said the F word, you, you. And I thought, ooh, this is nice. Uh, so it wasn't just Dick Cheney who came down to the floor of the <laughs> Senate and used that word against uh, uh, the senior senator from Vermont. Back in the day where there was real news. I mean, we had, right? uh, don't let anyone tell, tell you that nasty has started this year. That's right. It's been there for a long time. I did not cover the Adams and uh, the uh, fight back in the early 1800s with Thomas Jefferson. So those rumors so, are not true. You so were the, not there. I was on okay. assignment that day someplace <laughs> else. So the corrupt bargain, that, that story was broken by someone else. To somebody All else. Right. I was I'm beaten. sorry to say. Yeah. Sam Donaldson, thank you so much for joining us. David, David Amy, it's it. a real so pleasure. I enjoyed so being fun. with you. So and you very and much. God bless so the United go. States of America. <laughs> I may run. I may run. Well, <laughs> you got at least one vote here. I'm only 78. Sure. I mean, don't we need age Listen, and wisdom? If you run, come here to make the announcement, okay? <laughs> Thank, you. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. No, I have to go in Letterman. <laughs> All right. No. You know what's great is we get to follow Sam Donaldson up with his former teammate, Cokie Roberts, who's oh. joining us from the podium. She's watching all the action. And Sa Cokie, Sam's just saying he loves you. I know you already know that, but... Koki, can you give us a sense there? You're down on the floor. I just wish I just wish I had been I, I just wish I'd been in the booth with you and Sam. You know, it's always <laughs> fun to be with him. Well, these these people are having a good time now. Uh, they've just had some entertainment from uh, Neil Boyd from America's Got Talent, and they're all just you know re ready for the show to begin. But they're having a good time. They're happy. They're dancing around. They're holding up We Built It signs, and, uh, and they're beginning to break out the silly hats. And um, so I, th I think that uh, this is not a disconsolate convention by any means whatsoever. Um, it's, they, uh, I think we might be overplaying a little bit that they're not enthusiastic. They're ready to be enthusiastic. They, they, you know, they might not be in love with Mitt Romney, but they're happy to be here and they're happy to support the party. Koki, do you think, um, and listen, as you're right, look, we're looking at these pictures. I mean, the music helps a lot, and these guys are certainly ready for a party. We're looking at them dancing. Um, do you think that they need to love Mitt Romney? Is that actually a, a sort of requirement here for him? Or is it possible that, you know, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's not, the country doesn't need to fall in love with Mitt Romney, as Jason Chaffin suggested they do uh, when he was with us last night? They don't need to fall in love with him, but they need to like him enough so that it doesn't make them want to turn off their TV sets if he comes on for the next four years. And I really do think that, that there is a certain amount of that uh, when people make that fundamental gut check when they go to vote for president. Now, I think I think it's mainly a check that says, um, look, do I, do I trust this guy to do the right thing no matter what issue comes along because I have absolutely no way of knowing what issues are going to come along. I, you know, we didn't know this, the 1988 when we voted that the Soviet Union would fall apart in 1989. We didn't know in 2000 when we voted that the country would be attacked in 2001. Things happen. So we vote for president based 
basically on the, uh, the the check that we do that says, do we trust him to handle anything that does come along? And I'm sorry to say it is him always. Uh, but um, uh, we do also want to like him. And, uh, and so Mitt Romney does need to have um, now some more likability coming out of this. Um, but it's also true that it's a comparison. And so uh, it's not just what do we think about that guy? What do we think about this guy in comparison with the other guy? And, um, and right now on the question of likability, uh, Barack Obama is doing very well. On the issues, not so much. Well, and Koki, uh, I want to give you the opportunity to reminisce as well, Sam. W walk down memory lane with us from the 1972 convention in Miami. I'm just curious to get your take on what has changed and maybe what hasn't about covering these conventions and about being part of these over the years that you've been doing this. Well, of course, uh, of course, the very earliest conventions that I had anything to do with, and it was really not as a reporter, it was as the child of politicians. Um, uh, the first convention I went to was Atlantic City in 1964. And that was really the end of the boss run convention. Um, uh, but it, but they, you could still do it then. <laughs> and in fact, I remember the uh, Mississippi um, delegation, there was a challenge to the, the all white Mississippi delegation from a group called the Mississippi Freedom Party. And um, Barney Frank, who has of course since become famous as a member of Congress and uh, chairman of the uh, Banking Committee, the Financial Services Committee, was in Mississippi organizing it. And everybody up in Atlantic City kept saying, oh, there are a lot of white people for the Freedom Party too. And Barney sent a, a telegram to the organizers in Atlantic City and said, don't speak until you hear the eyes of the whites. Um, a little play on the uh, Paul Revere. Um, and uh, the Mississippi Freedom Party was not seated. But um, uh, the drama, of course, at that convention was all about uh, whether Bobby Kennedy would be put on the ticket, and Lyndon Johnson certainly wasn't going to have any of that. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting to talk about for tonight because with Ann Romney speaking tonight, there had been a move to have Jackie Kennedy speak at that convention. And um, uh, the, that would have been highly unusual. The, Eleanor Roosevelt had spoken in 1940, but that was it. And, um, uh, uh, but there had been a, a discussion of having her talk, and uh, Johnson absolutely put the kibosh on that. So uh, uh, the convention um, went the way he wanted it to go. Right. Uh, Koki, w w the other sort of modern invention that we've seen with these conventions this cycle and last cycle is sort of backloading them to the very end of the summer and doing them back to back. Uh, obviously, campaigns want to get that general election money uh, that they raise that they can't touch until the general election uh, a a as far into the season as possible. But what does it do? You're obsessed with polls like we are. What does it do to that notion of the convention bounce if they're both right back next to each other? Not each side gets the full sort of clean shot. I think that's right. I think we should say um, you all were talking earlier to Senator Orrin Hatch uh, about Mia Love, and she is on the po podium now, and that's what the crowd is going so crazy about, um, is listening to, to this Haitian American running for Congress in, in Utah. But, um, you know, the, the bounce is hard to get, and of course the, the party in the White House plans it so that they, they go last four, and go Mike on four. top One, of two, the three, other four. party. So um, it's it is um, harder to to make it really make a difference in the general election campaign, um, but I still think it makes something of a difference because, uh, as we were talking about earlier, the 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 country focused on the candidate gives that candidate an opportunity, particularly a new candidate uh, that they don't know to to introduce himself anew and, and for the country to get to know him in a special way. Thanks. Well, Koki, you know, you're right. Um, you not only Sam was... Go ahead, Amy. Oh, go ahead, Koki. I'm sorry. I just got cut off for a second. 
Uh, well, you know, Sam was talking about 1968, and um, another thing that I was thinking about with that was, you know, here we don't have George Bush is not coming to this convention, Dick Cheney is not coming to this convention, uh, because you know, there, there's a sense that that would not be helpful to the Republicans in this election. Um, in 1968, Lyndon Johnson wanted to come to that convention, um, which would have been just, I mean, chaos would have erupted. It was, it was terrible enough as it was. Um, I think actually I was the only person at that convention who faced down a policeman, and it's because I was very pregnant and turned around and, um, and said if he kept pushing me in the back with his stick that I was going to have that baby right then, right there, and that, um, that sort of did it. But um, Johnson wanted to come, and, uh, and, and uh, my father, uh, Hale Boggs, who was at the time uh, the majority whip and chairman of the platform committee, had to call Johnson and tell him he could not come to his own convention for his birthday uh, because it would have been uh, too big a problem for the party and the convention. That was a really bad moment for him. Cokie Roberts, love walking down memory lane with you. Love the insights. We're going to be coming back to you from the floor uh, very soon. But now we're joined by Holly Bailey, who is a Yahoo colleague, friend, covering the campaign on the campaign trail. Tell us what you're seeing out here. Uh, well, basically, I just flew in today with Mitt Romney. Uh, Ann Romney came back on the plane today. It was the first time she had spoken to us, to at least come back to the press camera to talk to us. Uh, was previewing her speech, seemed a little nervous, uh, but kept telling, talking about how excited she was. Um, and I think, you know, there's so much pressure on this speech tonight, and it's everyone's waiting for it. I think, in a way, we're looking forward to this speech more than Chris Christie's, just because there's so much pressure on her to try to humanize Mitt Romney. And um, they were rehearsing both of them, Mitt and Ann Romney, their speeches up in New Hampshire yes. uh, over the last couple of days. Um, d how do you get the sense? We're, we're learning so much tonight about how Ann sees Mitt, right? And we're going to see Mitt through her eyes. But how, what did he have to say about how he feels about watching her tonight? Well, he obviously came out and said she's doing great. She's so great. Uh, but she, when he would say that, if you look at any of the footage, she was, she was always kind of like, uh... <laughs> so, um, essentially, you know, what, what was funny about Anne today is just talking about, you know, sort of her inexperience with this sort of situation. She kind of jokingly complained about Stuart Stevens, who is Romney's chief strategist, telling her what she has to wear tonight. Uh, she joked about how, you know, she didn't realize that people had to tell her that. Um, so, in some ways, you know, people are really going to get to see what Anne Romney's personality is tonight, you know, and you, many of us see her on the plane, we get to see her a lot, you know, coming back and sort of joking, and so, you know, for a lot of people, this is going to be their first experience seeing her. Well, and for those of you who don't know who Stu Stevens is, he's a guy who is not exactly the best <laughs> dressed man out there. Okay, so here's one thing I need to know. Anne Romney talks a lot about these Welsh cakes. She seems to feed them to the press and everybody, any chance she gets to bring out these fresh baked things. <laughs> What are they? And uh, are they good? You can be honest. If if they're not good, I'm, you can tell us. I would never lie about okay. it. Uh, essentially, it's like a it's like a cookie. There's footage we're seeing, um, and it's, it's sort of flavored like a cinnamon roll in some ways. And so, uh, you know, it was good. Uh, you know, what, is it the top cookie I've ever had? No, <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> All right. So um, the real the next question is, when are you bringing some of those back for us? Oh, well, we're, she, we asked for the recipe today, and she was really cagey about it. She said we had to watch her make it. So, of course, we all invited ourselves over to their house to do that. I'm sure they'll <laughs> let you in. I'm sure they have no problem with that. Holly Bailey of Yahoo News, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be talking to you again throughout the whole week. So yes. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And did you sign the uh, iPad? I did. And you did? Is this you? Uh, is this yours? You've exposed me I'm sorry, what? in my horrible <laughs> handwriting. So this is so. Is this Oklahoma or Nebraska? It's Oklahoma. But my Oklahoma? oh, mm. 
<laughs> what is that your autograph? Yes, it is. Okay, I have the I like worst it. handwriting in America. And Oklahoma is not. What is? I've never. I, I mean, Oklahoma I have. I pad. have terrible penmanship. But seriously, I've <laughs> well, never I don't know ever what that seen is. something like this. It's a pan. <laughs> it's the pan of Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, we're going to save it. We got a picture. You'll Instagram it, of course. Uh, of course. Fantastic Instagrammer. Follow Holly Bailey on Instagram. Indeed. Her photographs Indeed. are exquisite. They are. Um, they are. So we'll save this. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Holly. Well, um, we're also very excited now to remind everyone that this, of course, is an ABC Yahoo News partnership, and that means we get the best of ABC News and the best of Yahoo. And, of course, one of the very best things about working at ABC News is getting to work next to George Stephanopoulos, who knows more about politics than really take all these people in here, well, squeeze them into one. Time. Keep well, going. you know, <laughs> we're just going to go on and on and on. Um, there's also the dirty little secret is you see us here. We look like we're in this booth that's huge, and it takes up all this space, and we have all this room. We are crunched into here. We and. Are. Where the ABC broadcast booth, where you, the primetime show, which was started at 10 o'clock tonight, is literally right there. Right there. George and Diana are normally next door, but now they are right here next to us. We could punch us. through here and see them. We could grab them through you that guys, wall. Will you guys wave to us later? Do, like, yes. Back we'll stretch out across. Can you across. stretch your arms and mm -hmm. do one of those? Mm -hmm. So, George, yeah. we were talking to Koki, and she thinks, it, I guess we were all out here watching the roll call before. It wasn't boisterous and raucous. Cookie thinks we're overdoing this a little bit. She thinks that there's lots of enthusiasm here from Mitt Romney. These Republican delegates are all excited. The floor is pretty full now. This this is filling up. Sort of the yeah. This is pretty good now. But with there's it's not like there's some like big sort of Mitt Romney hunger here, right? Which is unusual given the fact, I mean, I think that's true. I actually think it is true. Right. I mean, these delegates aren't in their hearts big time Mitt Romney people from the very beginning of this process. He was the guy, much like John Kerry for the Democrats in 2004, who they thought could win. Exactly. And he kind of outlasted the rest of the field. And there was even, you know, even saw, I'm sure you guys have talked about this, Ron Paul, the last guy standing, still won't say he's going to vote for Mitt Romney. Now, every single person in this hall, who's a delegate, is going to vote for Mitt Romney. Right. Get that no said. doubt about that. And and the second thing is though that they're com and the party is relatively unified now, particularly after the pick of Paul Ryan and the continuing disappointment in in President Obama. And what's getting them excited now is the idea that they're in a dead heat. This is a race they believe they can win. And I don't know what you guys think, but I think a year ago. Most of the people who were going to end up in this room probably didn't believe this was a race. Right. They thought Republicans could win. That's where the excitement is coming from right now. That's a very good point. And Diane, I want to go to you because you had a great interview today with Ann Romney. It was really good. It really got her to open up a lot. Do you think we're going to get to see that on stage? Or is it just so hard to be able to package that sort of intimacy when you're speaking to a hall this big? Well, she's a very informal person with a very formal assignment tonight yes. and the teleprompter included. And she told me that the governor said to her, just imagine a face in each of those teleprompter screens. But We're she is so much about what she's feeling at the moment and saying at the moment. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be startling for her. However, never underestimate her ability to communicate. Uh, that is true. My favorite line, though, is when she told when you asked her about wanting a girl. Yes. <laughs> and can you can you can you tell that story about when she was delivering her fifth and final right. child? No, she said to me, I'd never heard her say this no, before because we all look at those five boys and wonder. And she said to me, I'm thinking, surely I'll get a girl. Surely I'll get a girl. And then suddenly the last one <laughs> comes and it's another boy. And she couldn't believe it. But she said she learned a lot. And she learned a lot from boys, and part of what she learned is you just do it straightforward, no baloney. And, and she did feel, and we talked a little bit about it afterwards even, she does feel that girls, as we know, get a little mysterious sometimes, <laughs> particularly in their teens. And her boys just sailed straight ahead the whole way. And so she said it taught her something as a woman. I just, when I saw that part of the interview, I thought, I think Ben is the youngest. I, I think he is. Or um, I think, Craig. Oh, is Craig the youngest? Yeah. 
I wouldn't want to be him watching that interview that you're so disappointed <laughs> that it wasn't a girl. I feel they know everything about this. I, think so. I feel as she's going around the house, she keeps saying, one girl. If I just had one girl, this wouldn't be going on as there and food fights. She also uh, has said that she was the one that initially pushed Mitt to yeah. run again this time. That this, that he was kind of I, Tor obviously always very interested in running again but that it, she was the one that kind of pushed it early on yes she and she says that she really felt this was important for the country at this moment and whatever her reluctance to become a highly public person again and to take all the what was it mike huckabee said once that running for president is like putting your face in an electric fan, <laughs> and however reluctant she was to go through that again, she says she overcame it. And you have to wonder also, she knew what it meant to him. And she does seem a lot more comfortable this yes. time around. Much even, you know, yep. sure. she's even gone farther than him in relaxing and opening up out there on the sun. Well, and she's had such incredible response. I mean, starting with the tiny living room venues and then bigger and bigger and bigger. And we see her out there on the stage with him now, warming up the crowd, introducing him. Do you remember in yeah. Iowa, Amy and I went to one of those tiny living rooms in no, Iowa no. with Ann Romney in so December. Yep. And it was, I, what, would you say there were 25 women that. that she was talking? Maybe there were 25 women that had gathered for this lunch and she told the whole MS story and, and Mitt being there in the diagnosis. And you could tell she was she was learning how to be more comfortable with her own story in a way that we didn't see in the first run at all. It was th those intimate settings I think definitely helped her uh, get to the place where she could get on this stage tonight. She has a very very tough mission tonight. No, no, no question about it. Because as we've talked about, and Mitt Romney is coming into this convention, he's going to have to make some history. He comes into it with the lowest approval ratings, favorable favorability ratings of any nominee basically since we've been measuring uh, this. So, and and that's, that's really what's holding him back right now. There's a very big possibility that we have, we are facing the fourth wave election in a row. 2006, 2008, 2010, and now this year where the public is just in the mood to say, let's change horses one more time. What is holding them back right now are their feelings about Mitt Romney. And I, I love what Haley Barber, the former Mississippi mm -hmm. governor, uh, said about that today. He said, basically, after this summer, all most people know about uh, Mitt Romney is that he's a wealthy plutocrat married to a known equestrian. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they've really, and that's basically true. Well, yes, but George, that is, that shows the success of the Obama campaign's decision to spend early, spend more than they were taking in, to define Mitt Romney on their terms. And I, we, uh, Jonathan Carl and I, uh, talked with the Romney advisors this morning for a Yahoo and ABC Newsmakers panel. And one of the questions I asked them was, is that irreversible damage? Is, it, or is there some of it that is irreversible? Some of that permanent? They're not willing to concede that at all. But it seems to me that you cannot erase what the Obama campaign did completely. And, Mitt Romney and, it, and it, it's, it's not irreversible, but it is a big, a big hurdle. I'm thinking back right now to 1988. Uh, and what the first pr President Bush did to Michael Dukakis in three weeks in August uh, erased a 17-point lead for the Democrats, something he could never come back from. This is a very different race. You've got two-thirds of the country thinking we're going in the wrong direction. So Mitt Romney doesn't have as high a hurdle to climb uh, in convincing people that President Obama Without a doubt. should be thrown out. The question is, can he fill in? that biography in a ray. And you know, they keep talking about love tonight. I'm not so sure about that. I don't think Mitt Romney has to be loved, but he does have to be respected and trusted. People have to believe he can fix these problems and they, they, and they have a lot of work to do there as well. Well, the one other uh, interview today, of course you had Chris Christie on this morning. Um, he said he was gonna be bold and blustery, right? As we, we expect him to be. What's your sense, too, about what he needs to do here tonight? Not only for Mitt Romney, but for us to keep talking about him as for Chris a... Christie. Yeah, for Chris Christie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think he's very well aware that some keynoters go away forever and others get elected president, right. like Barack Obama. And, and it was a very telling. When I asked him about that, uh, it, it was funny. The first words out of his mouth were not about Mitt Romney. It was like, it's a, people are going to know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to know the real me. So he's going to do a lot about that. I think you are going to hear a lot about the New Jersey story. I think you are going to hear him contrasting the visions of the Republican and the Democratic Party. Now, what I'm being guided off of, and who knows, there's a lot of 
misdirection going on here. What I'm being guided off of is to expect the blustery. Uh, Chris Christie. They're talking much more about an adult conversation where Republicans can win on the power of their ideas. I think he'll talk about his biography. I think I'll have some good lines, but it doesn't feel like he's going for the feel of a traditional political speech that is just kind of red meat for the crowd. Yes, but again, this crowd is so ready for him. And That's even right. though we have the enormous difficulty of Isaac and everyone worried about what's happening on the Gulf Coast, they want to have fun. Yep. And they are so primed for him to walk out. They're going to be with him at the first sentence. I'm sure that's right. Especially after being delayed for a day. There's no doubt about that. But, George, I think you're right. I think part of what his mission tonight is from talking to some of his aides and the Romney folks is to get back to that Romney competence factor about sort of solutions in government. But not just Romney. Even, you know, if Ann Romney has to take care of her husband tonight, Chris Christie has to take care of the party. Right. Because the Republican Party is They're underwater right now yes. as well. He's got to fix the Republican Party brand, or at least begin the process of that. Now, George, last night, uh, Diane was here, and she drew almost a perfect map of the state of Kentucky. Yeah. I mean, I, it was, I mean, I mean, it's brilliant, so, but I don't <laughs> want you to be nervous. No so pressure. Yeah. You have to, uh, you're, we need you to sign in and then draw your home state. Which is Ohio, is that right? You know? Where it's, it's one of my home states. I'm uh, a little like Mitt Romney. Okay, well, there you go. go. <laughs> Sign in. You can draw whatever state, state you want. <laughs> right. you can pick I have to draw one. a state. You Are you kidding me? I'm not. You have to try wow. to draw a state. I thought morning television was hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we'll see who is the better cartographer on an iPad. First of all, look at the way he writes his name. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> I did it with an it's index got, finger. I know, but it's got three lines. <laughs> it's got 14 letters. I can't do that all day long. Okay. okay. I know. This is this is really impressive. If I were George, I'd say I was from Colorado. Just get it done. That's not bad. That's and Ohio. That's not bad. There you go. That's not bad. Take a look at that. That's not bad. Buckeye State. <laughs> It's Diane's more honest than you guys are. <laughs> there, there it is. But right that's there. very wise. That's very, there's a little bit of that difference there. I, I, it works for me. It was no Kentucky, I will tell you that. But it, 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 it works. It, <laughs> thanks thanks so much. Have a great thanks, show. Have a great tonight. show tonight. Good to see Goodbye. You. Bye. The show, of course, tonight going on at 10 o'clock. You can watch it on your ABC station, being able to take all of the Here's what you can prime do. time you can put speeches. the TV on the show yes, perfect. and keep the laptop going on this live stream so that you can experience both at the same brilliant, time. Yeah. Brilliant. It's yeah. that two screen experience. We all know you're doing it anyway. You're watching TV with your computer, whether you're checking eBay, whether you're on Twitter, whether you're on Facebook, you might as well keep it on this and you can tweet and Facebook. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you can do all of those things. It's like a four without. screen experience maybe. I'm listen, we got three at least that many screens yeah, no doubt. going on. So that's that's been our our. Uh, I, I still can't believe that that's. I mean, Ohio's pretty easy, right? L listen, you were talking to somebody with zero fine motor skills. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler, so, so I am so not gonna. Can you do you New know, Jersey? Not a chance. All right. Yeah, but I'll try before the week is out. All right, we'll make we'll make Dowd do Texas. You already now gave away our next guest. Oh, yeah, sorry. here we are. Matthew Dowd, ABC Hi. News contributor. Hey. Thank you so much for being here. Have you signed in yet? Yeah, I signed it, and I said back oh, there. Oh, you did Michigan. I, you I, did the mid. Did, oh, yeah. that's right. Which is easy. George's looked like something I've seen on a cave dwelling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he appreciates that. I'm sure that he appreciates that. Okay, so um, we haven't talked to. S we spent a lot of time talking about Amron me, but we haven't spent a lot of time talking about Chris Christie. And I say that because he is the keynote speaker. We know that in the past his prologue, some of those folks have gone on to great heights being elected president. Many of them are forgettable. In fact, more of them are forgettable than they are memorable. So are we blowing the Chris Christie keynote thing up a little bit too much? And how are we going to talk about him after this? How does he want us to talk about him after this? Well, Amy, I think it's a really interesting uh, question because conventions always, they always are designed so that, you're, that your candidate is going to win, but there's also a, a, a sense that it's, if your candidate loses, who's the next leader of the party? And everybody here obviously wants Mitt Romney to win, but there's also a sense is who are we going to look to if that doesn't happen 70 days from now? And Chris Christie is one of those folks that if Mitt Romney loses, just like Marco Rubio and some others that people are going to look at here and think, are they the next generation or are they the next round of leaders that we need to turn to? And so I think 
I mean, ultimately, Chris Christie's speech is not about himself. It's not about his future. It's about Mitt Romney's future. But I think people look at these speakers like Chris Christie and Marco Rubio and say, if maybe if Mitt Romney loses, that's our guy. And I know only junkies like us really pay, pay attention to 2016 before the 2012 race is over. But to your point, Marco Rubio, of all the state delegations he could go to a breakfast for here, and which delegates does he go talk to? South Carolina. Now, not a battleground state, right? But Marco Rubio goes talk to South Carolina Republicans. Uh, you see some of that jockeying already taking place. Yeah, it's we're on the permanent campaign where the general election regardless of what happens on November the 6th the general election campaign for 2016 starts on November the 7th that's going to happen we all know that just as how politics works but ultimately I think everybody here is trying to trying to do their best to, to create the dynamic that Mitt Romney gets some lift coming out of this convention the question is does he get any for many different factors can any any does he get any the way the convention is set up with the Democratic convention but ultimately does he get a lift and then the future, obviously, will be told after November the 6th. You know, the other question, too, is, and what seems to be unique, is what does President Obama do during this week? In the olden days, you sat back when, you, when it was not your party's turn. You let them have the stage for that week. We're way past that now, right? So President Obama going on the road tomorrow. He's going to battleground states, Iowa, Colorado, Virginia, talking to younger voters. What do you think that does to... You know, this idea, first of all, of a convention bounce, if there's any, or that any of this can actually sink in if two minutes after they make a speech, the president is already rebutting it. Well, I think I think it definitely affects the whole dynamic and also affecting the dynamic is a half a billion dollars in resources <laughs> that have spent coming into this convention, which has never happened before. All of those things. But there are moments in presidential races that people turn to and want to get a cue from. These are one of those moments. Even if they may catch part of it, the speeches, the vice presidential speech, Mitt Romney's speech, the debates, all of them are cues and moments that are important because they become, they put things in focus for people. And that's why I think these things are important. Less important, but still important. Well, and, you know, we are going to watch, of, of course, a number of other people come up here, including Rick Santorum, which... It, I don't know how rare this is, but to have a your former rivals come up and make speeches. But Rick Santorum, this was a pretty bitter rival at one point. But the Romney campaign is convinced they can use him as an, a very solid surrogate on this issue of welfare reform. Really going at those white working class voters that Rick Santorum was trying to get in the primaries as well. Tell me what you think about this strategy. There's been a lot of talk about whether it's effective or not whether there are Democrats saying this is race baiting to bring up the issue of welfare reform. How effective do you think this is going to be? Well, I, I think all of the issues like welfare reform and the discussions on Medicare and education, all those are are sub-issues to the broad dynamic of this. I actually think Mick, Rick Santorum could actually have a great message on the Rust Belt and what's happened and income and levels that have happened. He speaks very well to some of that working class as we all saw him during the primary. My guess is though Rick Santorum is going to be sent to a lot of places without a lot of media. He's going to be sent to a lot of gatherings that don't have a lot of media coverage, which would serve well when you add up one vote, two votes, ten votes at a time. Still has impact, yeah. I don't think they want Rick Santorum out in the media conveying what he's doing while Mitt, R Mitt Romney's running his campaign. But he'll be doing gatherings, just no, no place where there's a lot of media. But that entire uh, nomination season doesn't seem to have done any lasting damage to Mitt Romney. Would you, would you say? Well, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if we know that yet, David, okay. because I think all of us have talked about what he needs to do to fix the situation he's in, which is rehab himself and get people to sort of trust him and tap into him. There may be, he may be in this situation where he has a virus that he has no antidote to. Wow. And we'll know at the end of this convention if he was able to fix part of that. We'll know in the debates. But I think that damage that has ha actually could have started in 2007 in his race there and then went through this primary process, we don't know if there are permanent hits were taken that he can't fix. Matthew Dowd, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Glad you're here. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you very much. Doing that. Um, as we mentioned at the top of the show, one of the things uh, that we are going to be bringing you throughout all, all week long is sort of uh, what is going on in the social media space. Um, we have a team at Yahoo looking at social sentiment on Twitter, what is spiking, what's trending, and, and sort of giving us an analysis uh, of the conversation that is taking place there. 
And so we're now bringing in our Yahoo News colleague, Phoebe Connolly, who uh, has been looking at that stuff with uh, Yahoo's The Signal. That's the... Uh, that's the name that we assign to our. I like it. It just I have this analysis. image of. Beep, 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 exactly. Beep, beep, beep. Yeah. And it's supposed to give it's us. It's old school, of, but it, new school. Right. Yeah. Like it, it signals to us the, what's going on in, in that conversation. Phoebe, what have you been seeing uh, uh, as the convention has been getting underway tonight? Well, everyone is anticipating Ann Romney's speech this evening, and we have seen something this evening that is totally unprecedented. Twitter is not always the most positive place. A lot of people get on there to complain, to express discontent, but the sentiment surrounding Ann Romney is some of the most positive we've seen around any politician. So 68% of the tweets around Ann Romney are positive. Only 32% said, you know, had negative or mixed feelings about Ann Romney. Um, so by contrast, if you look at Chris Christie, the sentiment is about even, and Mitt Romney, her husband, he's still slightly more negative than positive in the way he's talked about in Twitter. So tell us, uh, you, you also brought some interesting s statistics to my attention, just about, we, we heard a little bit about the, uh, the Ron Paul contingent. Yes, I'm so glad you asked they, about that. They, they made some news today, down on the floor, there was some hubbub about the fact that Ron Paul delegates were not getting the respect that they wanted. They were yes. not able to speak as they wanted to. It didn't just translate on the floor, and this is what's fascinating about this convention, as we've said for a long time now, that this is a convention unlike any other because of the social media. So this is happening in a very small space, yes. not that many people, but it resonated on Twitter, and tell us about that. So here's what was interesting about the way it resonated on Twitter. Um, what we saw is a, a slow rising spike of a hashtag um, uh, which is um, hashtag RNC power grab if users want to look it up at home and what we saw is that Twitter just grew and grew and grew on Twitter and at 430 which was at sort of the height of this battle on the floor which was the rule change vote that hashtag overtook the official convention hashtag which was GOP 2012. So that's telling us there was a louder conversation on Twitter, if you will, a more uh, voluminous conversation on Twitter about that than about the convention overall. Yes, I, I, and you see everywhere you look, you're seeing this hashtag. It's all over all of these convention materials, and still the people on Twitter were able to overtake because that was the battle they wanted to fight. We can look at it right there. Yeah, look at that. that. That is GOP 2012 versus RNC Power Grab. And right where Phoebe said that 430 point, you can see where one overtakes the other. That's really uh, fascinating and, and I guess mirrored what we saw right here on the floor. Right. And I mean, the fact that this can, as I was saying, that this fight and whatever goes on here can instantly translate outside of this hall is, is uh, really a very different thing than we've seen at any convention before, so it's fascinating. Absolutely. Well, Phoebe, we love having you on here, giving us more of these updates. I know you're going to give us a little bit more in, in the next hour, the, ne the newest, hottest, buzziest things that are going on with this convention. I'm saying let viewers at home know you can always tweet at us, send us a question, and we'll bring it to you guys and, and make you answer. And uh, photos, right? Because you've, you've had your photo of the day. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So tweeted at us, David or Amy's handle or, you know, Yahoo News or ABC. Excellent. Phoebe Connolly, thank you so much. You. Thanks. We're all part of partnerships here, right? ABC right. and Yahoo have a partnership, and yep. you have a partnership uh, at ABC with Univision. That's right. Yeah, and so uh, Leon Krause, did I get that right? Leon Krause? Yeah. Uh, very of, well uh, of Univision is uh, here with us now. Thank you so much for joining us. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet you, sir. So, um, Obviously, you guys are paying particular attention to Hispanic speakers here which uh, at the convention, yeah. uh, which, which the Romney campaign has worked really hard to highlight and put front and center some very high-profile uh, Hispanic Republicans because it is, as we all know, one of the most crucial uh, voting groups out there this election season. Absolutely. Who Three should we be on the lookout for on the convention uh, program? Well, uh, tonight is particularly important and interesting. No? Three very high-profile figures, uh, the governor of uh, Nevada, the governor of New Mexico as well, the candidate for Senate from Texas, uh, three high-profile figures. Uh, Marco Rubio introducing Mitt Romney is uh, very interesting as well. Uh, and uh, there are at least a couple more high profile uh, uh, Hispanics at the stage in the coming days and that's clearly part of an effort from uh, the Republican Party to try to uh, close the gap between Obama and Romney which is right now at the historical uh, juncture no it's it's really large really large so 
we all know that that's why they would like to highlight those folks. But yeah. when it comes to talking to actual voters, Hispanic voters, about why they should pick Mitt Romney, the mm -hmm. fact that the gap is this big seems sort of unbridgeable by now. Is, that's what I think. Uh, is that what you think now it's too? So, so do, you, do you have the sense, though, that the Romney campaign is doing anything other than take the stage away for a minute, is doing anything within the Latino community to try to chip away at that historical yeah. gap. Well, they're, rec they're recruiting uh, uh, young uh, Latinos to be candidates in uh, many states, which is interesting, especially thinking of the future. But thinking of, the, of this election, what I've noticed is that uh, during the convention, what happens uh, uh, outside the stage, as you, as you mentioned, has to do with uh, highlighting the economy at every chance and making uh, uh, the electorate, especially the Latino electorate, forget everything that happened during the primaries. No, Just throw it under the rug, uh, the ultimate etch sketch and... Uh, uh, try to f uh, focus everything on the economy, betting that uh, that issue is going to matter more to Latinos than immigration, something that I think remains to be seen uh, 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 for November. And, and I just want to ask you about the uh, president's executive order on uh, yeah. halting deportations for young people. Mm -hmm. And um, we have not yet heard from Mitt Romney, although he's been asked several times whether or not he would rescind that order. But in talking to voters, the response on that issue alone, do you think that ev that has helped even widen the gap that the president had? Absolutely. And I think that uh, the, Romney, the Romney campaign is not helping matters, to be honest with you. Uh, I interviewed uh, 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 Governor Sununu yesterday, and he said what one president can make, one uh, another president can on make. So that leaves uh, the question mark in the mind of many voters uh, whether or not Romney would on make what the president what the president made with uh, deferred action decision which was incredibly important uh, for the Latino community. The one thing though that I, I hear from a lot of Democrats and even many Republicans is regardless of the gap, the fact that more people would vote for Barack Obama than Mitt Romney the enthusiasm does not seem to be there among Latino voters for yeah. Barack Obama like it was in 2008. So the concern is among Democrats, yeah, we may they may like to vote for us, but they are, they may not turn out. We may not get those numbers again. What's your sense when you're talking to voters about whether or not they're going to come out in those numbers? What do they need to hear from Barack Obama? Well, that's that's a big question, especially when it comes to deportation. No, uh, One uh, in four Hispanics in this country has had a, a relative, someone close, uh, detained. So it's a personal issue for them. The deportation decision from uh, the president was controversial and it's going to be difficult to unmake uh, uh, the voters' minds. Uh, but of course, a turnout, is, turnout is key. In my opinion, uh, the enthusiasm is not there, but still the number are impressive the polling doesn't lie and uh, we'll see what they do next week to uh, to build support again and to uh, bring uh, Latino voters out out it's going to be a good question Leon Caruse of Univision thank you so much for thank being you. with us we it's really a pleasure. appreciate it thank you so much thank you well we're gonna take a look down on the floor where our John Carl is roaming we've been told he's roaming around Hello. talking to delegates which sounds a little <laughs> dangerous but yes uh, Amy I'm coming to you now from microphone. Florida Got between Florida and Pennsylvania. As you can see, you know, Florida, you would expect to have front row seats, right? I mean, after all, uh, arguably the most important state. Uh, and obviously, this is where we're having the convention. But you notice they got kind of pushed back a little bit because of that whole controversy of moving their primary date forward. But Amy, I'm here, and they have just um, unveiled a new uh, placard. We built it, uh, having a lot of fun with, uh, with, with this slogan. And this is uh, kind of something we're seeing with this. With the various speeches unroll new themes and we're going to be seeing little posters like this but the big event tonight obviously Amy and Romney followed by Chris Christie John what are you uh, what are you expecting to hear from Chris Christie are you, are you hearing me Amy? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes 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 we are John it's David can you hear me I'm not hearing you okay well I guess I'll take well John let me I ask think you're asking me what I expect John, to hear from Chris Christie Yes, That's exactly correct. what we're asking you. You're a mind reader. Christy, known for his bombast. I saw him this morning, and he was joking about putting a heckler in the front row, uh, because that's obviously <laughs> uh, what's been his trademark, is his ability to just push back, come at 
uh, with blunt talk, tell people in some cases what they don't want to hear. That's made him uh, the, the hero to the conservatives here. And in New Jersey, it's actually helped him uh, reach out to independents. I mean, this is a guy that has pretty good approval ratings in a state that is dominated by Democrats, and yet he is becoming the biggest or one of the biggest stars for the right wing of this party, uh, somebody who was practically begged to run for president. So I think we're going to hear a little bit of that. We're going to hear a very tough speech uh, against President Obama. And then he tells us we're going to hear a lot about what, what he calls the New Jersey comeback story. And he'll remind you the New Jersey comeback is not complete. New Jersey's unemployment rate is higher than the national average. He knows that, but he says he's put New Jersey back on the right course, working with, uh, with with Democrats in the legislature, and that's what he's going to be talking about. But, of course, taking some very tough swipes at President Obama. Yes, very much so. What he needs right now is a boardwalk and some guy with an ice cream cone, and then that will really fire him up, okay. John. That's, we, know, we know what the boardwalk does to him. All right. Thank you, John Carl. Thank you, John. We're now joined, though. We're going we're gonna to talk. We're going to move from talking about, we've talked about, Latino voters, we have talked about women voters, and now we're going to talk about young voters. And uh, joining us now, we have Jason Rubsica, is that right? Close enough. Close. No, no, no. <laughs> tell uh, us, tell us what it is. Rezepka. 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 Okay, Rezepka. Oh, that's good. I, I appreciate the second half. Rezepka. <laughs> uh, you're with MTV, uh -huh. and you're putting together what is essentially fantasy football for political types. Right? So it's political fantasy football. Can you walk us through what that is and why you think that may be the new thing to engage younger voters? Certainly. So we, going back 20 years, have worked to break new ground to empower young voters uh, and to get them answers to the questions from the candidates and to bring them into the process. And the way we're viewing this year is there's a term we found in our research called election avoidance, where there's a lot of young people that are actually actively avoiding the election, where in 2008 they were embracing it. They were running towards it. Now they're running away from it. So we needed to find a new way to bring them in. And we're seeing this, this trend called the gamification of youth culture, where young people increasingly view life through a game lens. So we thought, what if we put a game layer on top of the whole election and, and use that as a way to engage them? We know that fantasy is tremendously popular with our audience. Uh, and what if people spend as much time researching the backup tight end for the Seattle Seahawks as they spent researching the person who's running for Congress in their district? Having just picked my fantasy football team last week in a draft, I will say I would have much rather played this fantasy election because I was <laughs> so much more prepared to pick this team than I would be the uh, football team. My team is not that good. But how does the game work? Explain, explain uh, what people actually do sure. here. So there's two pieces to it. The, the main piece is very similar to the way that fantasy sports work. So you draft a dream team of candidates that you would like to field, and, and you draft a team of 12, and it's people running for the presidency and, and Congress. Um, the different thing is, when you look at this, you say, what, what are the points? How are we going to measure them? The way we measure points are not uh, the conventional measures. So if we were going to do a conventional fantasy politics game, we say, how much money did you raise last quarter? Or how many f Twitter followers do you have? Instead, we measure the transparency of your fundraising. We measure your honesty. How honest are you being on the campaign trail? Are you actually addressing uh, issues in the ads that you're running? Or are you mudslinging? So we've got 15 data partners, all best-in-class experts, including PolitiFact, Center for Responsive Politics, etc., giving us that data. And we're saying, like, are candidates giving us the democracy we deserve or not? And so we're giving them points on, on those measures. Uh, and then the flip side is young people can get bonus points for getting involved in the elections. So if you read uh, political content online, if you check into events, being here tonight, if you were to check in on Foursquare, you get bonus points in the game. Uh, so, so we're kind of asking, like, what if we could have a fantasy election where candidates are honest and trans transparent and young people are participating and, and empowered that's that's, that's the that does sound like an ideal world and then you know the one that uh, certainly much different than the one we're living in although so it's different about this from other fantasy games it seems to me if if it's transparency honesty those sorts of things and uh, transparency and how you run your campaign you're not really looking for the person who's necessarily going to win right so your candidate doesn't have to win in order for you to get points? It's not only about winning, because I think we see people going to outrageous measures to win, and in, in the process, they're forgetting about the voters. They're forgetting about 
these constituents that they're setting out to represent. And, and that's something that is really pushing our audience away from politics. They frankly become quite disgusted with this process and the fact that it's about the billions of dollars you need to raise and the super PAC money that needs to come in to get you into office. And they're saying, I want to know where you stand on the issues. I want to know if you're going to deliver on the key issues and challenges that I'm facing as a young person. I expect you to be transparent, honest, and civil. And so we're making a dashboard where we can track that stuff and celebrate those candidates that are doing a good job in that regard. So you don't think it'll it'll discourage uh, would-be new new voters and younger citizens when they come to find out that the candidates who do raise the most money and maybe do run the most negative ads are the ones that win? Well, I don't I don't think that it's just about winning. I think uh, there's a an opportunity to use this as a way to hold candidates accountable in a new way because this data is out there. Right now it's often at the fringes of the web. If right. we can bring it to the forefront, put it in a game context, and, and then reward those candidates to do well, and then reward those young people who do the, the research to understand that, there's a whole bunch of prizes. You could win $25,000 in, in a trip to the VMAs by being the grand prize winner in fantasy oh, elections. Can, wow. I, can, I, can I join, or do you, is there an age cutoff? Yeah. There's no age cutoff. You guys are eligible. Maybe Ooh. I'll see you at the VMAs next year. Ooh. I'm totally signing up okay, for that. Okay, that excellent. sounds excellent. I love that idea. Jason Rezepka. Rez Before I go, Rezepka. I have for, one for each of you. We have playing Thank cards. I got uh, Paul Ryan. And here's Romney oh. for you. There you go. Okay. Look at that. So here's how we can do the fantasy election right here. Oh, we, we do have to ask you to do one thing, we Jason. Grab that iPad. Uh huh. Okay. So we're asking every guest who comes in here to sign on our virtual guest book. Mm -hmm. And so we're asking you all sorts of, you can doodle whatever you would like, what America means to you, your home state. Uh, you know, you can certainly put in. A a anything that you think sort of represents sign your, maybe sign young your name voters. There. I That's have perfect. terrible penmanship, but we I'll, all I'll do. do my best. That's There's okay. no. This is a, this is an iPad. I don't. We don't need to worry about that quite. All right. Um, I hope we saved George's by the way before because I just deleted it. He may need to draw Ohio again. We did. I be. Uh, we oh, good. That. All right, because we we're never going to see that Ohio <laughs> ever again. That looks like that. What do you got there? Let's have a fantasy election. Excellent. Look at that. All right. Love it. Let's have a fantasy election. Everyone check it out. Check out the MTV fantasy election website. Yeah, put the Paul There Ryan it is. It's right, right there. there. What? Yep. Yeah, well, that's actually Mitt Romney. <laughs> but we're, we're, you, get the, you, get the, you get the gist. 25 grand. I mean, if that's not enough to entice you to bad. come and do that, no. to the VMAs, Jason. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks a lot, Jason. Appreciate really it. appreciate okay. you coming in. We're going to take you back to memory lane. Actually, none of you watching this remember this at all. We're going to take you back to the very first Republican convention ever for another historical convention moment. We are now joined with the uh, former chairman of the Florida Party, yes. Florida Republican Party, and now the chairman of the American Conservative Union, which uh, throws that CPAC event that we all know so well every year, the Conservative Political Action Conference. Al Cardenas, thank you so much for joining us. Ah, it's great to be with you in this great convention, an exciting first day. In your home state. At home state, can't have it better than that. So let's, so let's start there, because we saw a new poll out, a CNN poll coming out that shows the president at 50%. That's the magic number here in Florida, uh, the slightly better numbers than we had seen for the president in the Sunshine State against Mitt Romney. Uh, do you think that Paul Ryan's addition to the ticket is, is making the road for Romney here in Florida a little trickier? You know, I don't. I think, uh, obviously, 35% of the voters in Florida over 65. Medicare is a big deal. I thought it was genius to pick Paul Ryan because folks need to know the truth. We need to have an adult conversation about Medicare and what will make it work not only for our current citizens but 
current seniors, but our future seniors. And so I thought Paul Ryan came to the villages, did a great job. And, you know, it takes a while to digest that information, but I, I, I feel good that we're talking about it in a, the way that seniors we serve. Well, the other issue in, in Florida, of course, is, uh, is a Latino vote. And there's been a lot of discussion, of course, about whether Marco Rubio would have been a better pick as the VP candidate to help narrow that gap that, uh, between uh, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. What do you think that Mitt Romney can do, needs to do, to win over that Latino vote? Because right now all our polls are showing there is a big, big, big gap. Right. Well, the good news is that Latinos are as dissatisfied as anyone over the last four years. Their degree of dissatisfaction is through the roof. They have a higher unemployment number. Their education, graduation numbers are down the drain. They need hope and they need a vision for tomorrow. Mitt's not well known. Uh, the best numbers we ever gotten were with two governors uh, from California and Texas. They were well known. Mitt's from Massachusetts. It's taken him a while. There's a real big, large, soft spot. There are more Latinos getting uh, registered as independents than as Democrats, and that's a good sign for us. Mitt doesn't need to do a huge somersault here. He needs to gain three or four points in the key swing states within the Latino community in order to get the job done. And then we've got a long ways to go to be the kind of party we need to be in the Latino Latino community. But that, I understand that you want to start with the good news and that there is dissatisfaction, but you you do acknowledge there's a long way to go, and I, I have not yet heard from Mitt Romney other a, a direct appeal in a very specific way on sort of the issue of immigration. He had come through a tough nomination season where there was a lot of real hardline talk on that issue. And I and there's no doubt our polls do show that Latino voters care about the economy like all American voters care about the economy most importantly. But we also know that this issue of immigration resonates really loudly inside the Latino community. And and the Republicans had a had a tough time with that issue in terms of reaching those voters this this last nomination season. Is there enough time between now and November 6 to make up that, that work? This convention is uh, very important for that purpose. And, and look, we come off a banner year. In 2010, we elected three Hispanic Republican governors, a uh, Hispanic senator. We're, Ted Cruz is going to join the Senate as another Hispanic leader. Democrats have none of that. We had a banner year in 2010, and these are going to be powerful surrogates. They're going to be unleashed in all the swing states to talk to the Hispanic community in our language about Mitt Romney. And tonight, tonight will be a start, but tomorrow and Thursday we'll have Marco Rubio and Brian Sandoval and Susana Martinez, the most impressive list of surrogates uh, we've ever had. And also, we've had more Hispanic events at this convention than we've ever had before, starting last night. So I, I'm encouraged. Do you think when you send those surrogates out to talk about the Mitt Romney record, he has to give those surrogates a real definitive answer on this executive order that President Obama put out the other day, in which obviously now you have a lot of people applying for uh, this, this time period where they can stay here. So are you encouraging the campaign to say, we, we can't go out there and talk about this until we have a, a real answer from the Romney campaign about what he would do as president on this issue? Well, absolutely. Here's what he said that's encouraging. He's the only candidate who said that he's committed to a bipartisan solution for immigration reform. President's answer is my way or the highway. Four years, it hasn't worked. If he continues in that path, in four more years, it wouldn't work either if he gets elected. There are only two presidents over the last 32 years have done anything about immigration reform. That was Ronald Reagan in 1986 and George Bush, who tried in 06 and 07. Mitt Romney's committed to a bipartisan solution. I'm comfortable he'll do it. I've talked to him about it. Marco Rubio's talked to him about it. He's got uh, folks like Jeb Bush and myself and Marco who are committed to immigration reform, and he's listening. And I'm convinced that in the campaign trail, people will gain more confidence that he does mean it, that we're going to have a bipartisan solution. Not the Democrat way, but in a bipartisan way. Back in uh, February, when you uh, were overseeing your cons conservative political action conference, Mitt Romney took the stage and almost, it seemed, was still trying to convince the, the gathering there that he was one of them. He said, I'm a, I was a severely yeah, conservative yeah, Republican yeah, governor, yeah. severely. Has he, has he made that case to his own party yet? Or does some of this week, he still needs to convince these folks that, that he's one of them? Well, you know, that's a fair question. 
Uh, and I will admit that there have been some folks on a wait-and-see attitude in the conservative community, but he's checked two boxes. One was a Paul Ryan selection, and two has been a very conservative platform. I think both of those items have gotten those folks who are on a wait-and-see approach enthusiastic about supporting him. There is also this undercurrent still of Ron Paul support. There's yeah. a sense, I think, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's more than just a fringe. There are people out there who really believe that there's a, there's a libertarian edge to this party. Plus, they really do like the idea that the Tea Party pushed forward about more transparency, about letting, you know, sort of regular folks be part of this, uh, part of this party in a way they hadn't been before. How do you think that the convention is addressing this? And what do you think it means overall for the party that you have the Tea Party influence here that really wants things to be different from the way that they saw things well, before? Well, look, it's a different environment. I wrote an op-ed about it today. And uh, basically I said, look, this is unlike any journey we've ever taken. It used to be you had the Republican Party and you had the candidate, and we marched in unison towards a common goal. Now you've got the Tea Party, you've got the establishment, you've got super PACs, you've got independent groups, and you've got the new media, such as yourselves, who can go viral at any moment. <laughs> and so it's like Eisenhower and the Allied Forces. You've got to be a, a commander-in-chief like no one's ever had. I think Mitt, if anybody's possible, of harnessing all of these energies and putting them towards a common path, it's Mitt Journey and Mitt Romney. He's disciplined. He's uh, complicated. He understands how these inter integral parts work. And I think we'll do a good job in harnessing all these various groups towards one common goal in the last 70 days. Al Cardin is chairman of the American Conservative Union. Thanks for uh, stopping by. I hope something you said goes viral yeah, tonight. Yeah, if you would like to have yeah. something. <laughs> or you can say something really, really crazy and let yeah. it go viral or do something that would put us on the uh, You know, I've got to work lab. on my provocative stuff. <laughs> right. I'm not there yet. Anytime you want to do that, thank you, you can so come thank back. Thank you very thank much. You Really Thanks for Make sure you me. sign Great in on our you. iPad, okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that would be that would be excellent. Um, you know, Florida, of course, David is. I mean, we keep we kind of forget about that. The fact that we're in Tampa, and it is a battleground. We're right here on the I four corridor. Everybody talks about Hillsborough County, which is where we're seated right now, as a bellwether county. Twelve of the last thirteen president, uh, they've decided twelve of the thir last thirteen elections. They've been the one that picked the president and correctly forget, of all the battleground states it has the most electoral votes it it's has the, the most electoral prize. votes yes. and it is huge in terms of just how expensive it is uh how how difficult it is it difficult it is to communicate i was talking to one uh consultant in the state who told me that you know just in one media market in florida that is the equivalent of multiple states right, right. i mean you really uh, you can't understand how big Florida is, and diverse as well. We, we've talked a lot about seniors and Latinos, but you have new, younger people coming in here. You have people who bought houses here in the boom times who now are underwater. So this is just a uh, this is a Florida that is more than just one demographic. It is, in many ways, three or four different states. Well, and anybody who runs statewide in Florida will tell you that the way in which you win Florida is on television, on the airwaves. And that, it, you were talking before, when we were talking about the MTV game, like, what do you tell these young people when the person with the most money and runs the harshest ads actually wins? That's Florida, folks. I mean, it is, it is a state where if you hammer away on the airwaves, if you've got more money, this is a state where you have a little more advantage. That may not be the case in states like Iowa and others, but it is the case here. Well, and if you are turning on the airwaves here in Florida, you're going to see a lot about a Senate race that is featuring uh, – Connie Mack is a re Republican against the sitting Senator Bill Nelson. On TV, there are ads, and I'm not kidding about this, that feature Hooters, uh, that uh, feature driving under the influence, bar hopping. It's basically um, not exactly subtle attacks on the Connie Mack's character by the Bill Nelson campaign. So it is rough, rough and tumble. I did talk to one here. Florida voter today who said, I am ready to throw my shoes into the television screen. I would so be too. I would be too. We now turn to Mary Phillips Sandy of Comedy Central. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having Good me to here. to be here. What, what, are, what is Comedy Central up to here at the convention? Well, we're having a great time. Uh, despite the heat and, uh, and some of the weather that we've been having, we've been hanging out outside the convention center, talking to some of the protesters who've been here, um, 
soaking in some of the really uh, elaborate and hilarious signs that people have made to bring here to exercise their First Amendment rights uh, so we can exercise our First Amendment rights to write jokes about them on Twitter. Okay, so uh, your favorite moment thus far? Oh, man. Um, you to, know, To joke about, of course. To joke about. Well, um, on, a, on a personal note, I was tweeting while walking, and I walked into a pole, and <laughs> a really friendly riot cop made sure I was okay. So that was, that was kind of a nice, friendly moment. Um, but I've actually really enjoyed seeing some of the impromptu moments outside the convention. Just today, there's been a lot of spontaneous Ron Paul uh, supporter demonstrations that have just sort of... People start running. There was literally some people in a park, and they said, let's go. And they just grabbed some signs and started running toward the convention center, uh, which is, you know, the sort of thing that you really only see here at a, at a national convention like this. I remember when we were chatting with you on Super Tuesday and uh, about how you guys were finding all the humor throughout the nomination season. I would imagine all those debates with all those candidates, yes. it's a little easier to find humor. I, is it as easy to find humor here at the convention? Well, certainly the convention is, as you know, a huge uh, logistical event, right? There's so much going on. There's so much ground to cover. We don't have a big team. Uh, but luckily, we can really keep track of things through the social web, Twitter. We can really stay in touch and find out what's funny where, even if we aren't there ourselves. So that's helped us out a lot. Now, are you getting invitations from any of these delegates to come to their parties or to join no. them in the skybox? No? Not yet, but I'm available. You can put it out. <laughs> I, I think anybody here who has a ticket wants funny people to come. Yes. Um, but... Do you risk, of course, getting made fun of? Well, but the thing is, is invited. that, yes, I, I mean, that is that is what we do, but we are really great party guests. I'll just put that out there. And you've not been to any of the uh, sort of fundraising gatherings out and about? The, the, like, no. The outside groups that have been going sort of No, you need invitations party? to get into those things. I, I will thought, at Comedy Central, don't you just crash those things? Yeah. Uh, like no, because, no, lawyers, we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but, but I will say this. I did attend a really fantastic... Um, movie today. It was it was Newt Gingrich's biopic of Ronald Reagan, uh, the Reagan-esque president, of course, Ronald Reagan. Was this uh, at Newt U? No, no. This oh, was in okay. the Citizens United movie tent, okay. ah. which if you have not been, there's free tacos and great air conditioning. Oh, um, great idea. Newt and Callista were there in person, uh, and um, it was incredibly Reagan-y. You felt you felt you left feeling as Reagan-y as you possibly could. I was oozing Reagan out of my pores. Yes. So um, when you look at you know we have a lot of funny hats here yes. and we have people that are dressed up, but yeah. that seems almost too easy for you guys, it right? Is, I it mean, is. so you're a little more subtle than that. So is there something else about a convention delegate that you can find something funny? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be about them, but right. just about the idea of being a convention delegate. It is. Well, the process itself, as we've seen today with all of the debate about the RNC and the policy rules, there is something inherently ridiculous about the way we do this in America, right? And, you know, to start from the local state conventions that have their own color and their own flavor and then to come here and amplify it times a thousand, I mean, I think it really puts on display some of the inherent silliness of how we actually choose our presidents here in the United States in 2012. Um, okay, I have to ask you, is okay. this yours? Okay, you got to okay. show. Right. Okay. I don't even know so, what's going on. There. All right, so that is an incredibly poor rendering of the safe where Mitt Romney's tax returns are locked. And that oh. those are chains and that's a padlock. Wow. And I will admit... That I, might be the most conceptual sign-in we've had so yeah, far, right? Yeah, yeah. I draw as well as Mitt Romney tells a joke. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> oh, wow. God. You don't think See? Mitt Romney's very funny, I guess. Oh, because this drawing would, I think, would like suggest me, that. You know what? He tries, just as I tried. It's just a, 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 it's never going to succeed. Mary Phillips Sandy of Comedy <laughs> Central, thank you so much for being with oh, us. Oh, thank, thank you, you for having me. It was we a pleasure. We appreciate it. And and when you tweet funny things about us, they can be about how funny we are, right? Not, guys, not yes. about, okay. No, no, You're we're not making here. fun of us. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> I love. Thanks a lot. I love hearing that. Thank you. Um, you know, there is a lot here that you do have to sort of chuckle about this process. And if there's one thing about this convention that's been getting a lot of us, both, well, certainly the reporters, but even some delegates, we're joking about it now, but there's a fine line between joking and frustrated. It is the level of security here. There are many people who are comparing the, the scene around this Times Forum like a, the DMZ. You have to go there. There are literally guys with really big guns, there are big fences. Getting through the process a, is, is taking it and is it's a logistical hurdle. There's no is. doubt about it. We are now joined by ABC's Cecilia Vega. 
Hi, how are you? Thanks for you, being here. You guys are making me go after uh, Comedy Central. I know. I know. Well, well, you have you the material funny, here, You have though. good, funny Come material. On. You talked with all those zany Killing delegates out there. What did you find when you were talking to You know someone? what's so funny? It's you, you really got the sense on the floor, you guys have probably been down there today, that they've been like cooped up for a day. <laughs> <Totally>. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're like dying to get out. And so, you know, they brought out like the sparklies and they brought out the hats and kind of dusted everything off. It was like they couldn't, yeah. they were like, you know, I would imagine when they opened the doors today, they were just like pushing them in trying to get out here. Did you get that sense? I did. Well, and you also spent some time yesterday with the folks who were cooped up. And what kinds of things were they doing with their day off? Yeah, a day off. The hurricane day. Yeah, you'd think it was like a, you know, a beach day in, in Florida. Right. But no, these, it was really actually funny. Um, the South Carolina contingent out there on the beach they were playing poker they were they had like something called pints and politics i think um the new york contingent was out on the beach also california took in the 2016 movie i think a lot of people did that yep. they say the lines at the movie theater down the way from the convention center were actually packed so come today right uh, they really could not just wait to get in here and it was a really you know it's a it's a fun vibe out there um you really get the sense that everybody is really committed um everybody is waiting for Thursday. They're waiting to see their guy. Um, they brought out the costumes. I have to actually, guys, actually take a look at and listen yeah. to some of the stuff that we heard out there because these Kansas folks that we talked to today, they won the prize hands wow. down. Take, take a listen. Yes. We're down on the convention floor with the Kansas delegates and I got to tell you, this is about as crazy as it gets when it comes to costume and we have seen some crazy ones out there. I'm um, the Wicked Witch of the West. The Wicked Witch of the West, of course you are. Alphaba, Alphaba, or Alphaba from Wicked. Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. Yes, yes, born and raised in Kansas. I'm Wyatt Earp and I'm uh, for Mitt Romney, so this is right here. And we're not messing with you. No, fear, you need to fear the mustache. Your mustache is about to fall off. I fear it. I see one other thing I want to show you here. We cannot forget, this is Kansas. Romney. It doesn't get any more Kansas than that. Oh, come on. I mean, Come that, that is. Yeah. Although I give that, that you are great. right. I'm so glad that you found the prize-winning delegation because I like that they went into their own cultural history and totally embodied it. Yeah, the, they they were on the extreme side, but they weren't the other ones. Hawaii was rocking the lays and yeah. the the shirts. Texas, you've seen everybody's seen the Texas people walking around with the big hats, right? I mean, they're not holding back out there. Um, I saw a lot of sequins, but te but Kansas, the shoes, they had me. They had me at the ruby slippers. The well, ruby what slippers. I what I appreciate though is they didn't just do that. That's pretty easy, right? to just do the Toto and all of that. But the fact they did Amelia Earhart and Wyatt Earp. Now, Todd Teahart, of course, is a member of Congress, right? right? So that's not, you that's, that's a little bit rare. You rarely see that with the mustache and the whole thing that was. We rarely see members of Congress in costume. We're, we're, we're saving this footage for the archives, right? When, whenever we need this. I, I happen to be down uh, by chance, standing uh, down in Massachusetts when Romney was officially declared the nominee and they lost it. I mean, it was just sheer pandemonium. You couldn't wait. I was trying to talk to our producer and we couldn't hear anything. Um, and it was really interesting talking, not just to some of the folks from Massachusetts, but folks from all over the country. Um, we had a really interesting conversation with a delegate from New Jersey. These guys are ready for tonight to hear Chris Christie. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. They're not uh, holding back when it comes to their emotion and their connection about him. And I think there's, we've got some sound from a woman that we spoke to. Um, there's definitely a desire to see him in a much more prominent role than they're going to see him tonight. Uh, they're looking forward already to 2016. Uh, take a listen. This is the most important button. Chris Christie is the most important button. Absolutely. Is that a little uh, blasphemous to say in these halls? Not on this day. He's doing the keynote tonight. He's, he's the bad, you're the big backer of that guy. <laughs> he really is. Now tomorrow it'll be all about the vice president and the next day it's Mitt Romney from there until election day. But tonight it's Chris Christie. We need somebody like Chris Christie. All right, well, I mean, come on. She's right. not hiding it, right? No, she is she's not, not hiding, hiding it. it. No, I said, are you all. sad that he's not out here tonight? She goes, he'll be out here one day. Whoa. Well, right. There you go. That's, all right. Okay, Have you this? signed in yet? No. Oh, okay. okay. So every guest that's coming here signs in in the in our uh, digital uh, sign-in book. We'll take. I'm going to take your photo while you do it. Okay. And yeah, we'll put that up on the slideshow. Yes. And then sign your name and then either draw your home state or draw a picture of what this election means to America. Oh. Or what is the other option? No there? pressure. No pressure. 
Don't do it too quickly because I have to load up my camera. Are you kidding me? Here. I don't know how to draw. It's going to be really bad here. <laughs> I think, you know, remember, this is this is for posterity, so no pressure. Yeah. Uh, just, just, do, you know what, do you know what I'm doing? Watch out. I, I don't even know. Can you show the picture of the... It's. No, I was asking David. Can uh, this is so bad? Oh, show the picture gonna, of the. This is gonna look um, inappropriate. I yeah, think. Yeah, I'm a little concerned wow. about what it's, you're drawing. It's supposed to be a shoe. <laughs> the ruby slippers. Oh. It's supposed to be a shoe. You know what? It was going in a really odd direction. <laughs> so I almost put the second one on there, and then I stopped myself. <laughs> As oh I God. saw you drawing that, I was like, <laughs> you guys are gonna Cecilia have me unemployed. Vega, after this. You know what? You. It's actually. I think that's a shoe that Pinocchio wore. My that is. God. That is a <laughs> good job, guys. That watching. was that that was wow, wow. Okay, Done. first you and know last what? time we see each other. <laughs> <laughs> Cecilia Vega, thank you so much for being with us. Guys. You'll bring us more color throughout this the week. This is great. It's great this stuff. Is, really great is, stuff. This is how we go viral, Cecilia. That's <laughs> seriously. Thank you for that. Uh, that is viral. No, not at all. I think that looked very Pin Pinocchio shoe like. I think that's that's perfect. Now, the one thing that we want to make sure that we get to you folks here at home is a sense of who these people are on the floor, right? We talk a lot about Mitt Romney, about the candidates, about the consultants. Here are the people, many of them down here, but we're gonna have two of them up here who are the actual delegates. People who come from their home state. They've, many of them have traveled thousands of miles to come here, cast a vote for the nominee, and spend three, four days engaged in some of it arcane, some of it you know, much more uh, artistic, I guess you can say, celebration of their party and of, of their nominees. So um, I wanted to, to introduce in, introduce you guys. We have I'm Heather. Heather. You're Heather and your, your husband, uh, Byron Alvarez, who's uh, getting mic'd up right now. You guys are from outside of Atlanta. We are, yes. All right. And so... Um, Tell us a little bit about how you got here. Whether this this is your first convention that you've been to, right? This it is, is. A, this is a first time thing. So how do you decide? One day you're at home, life is pretty normal. The next day you say, you know what, honey, we're, we're going to the convention. That's right. That's right. Well, um, I've been involved in local politics uh, my whole life and working on campaigns and really a, a big part of the Republican movement in Georgia for a long time. And um, I've attended state conventions, county conventions, all the mass meetings for years. And this year, I just, I really wanted to go the next step. And I, I felt like, you know, this is, we hear it over and over again, but it really is, you know, the election of a lifetime. And I wanted to be a part of it and bring in and bring America back and be a part of the, you know, being able to nominate. So what did it take? What did you have to do to actually become a delegate? What's the process? Well, I marry her. <laughs> 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 well, well he, he's actually my lucky guest. Oh, he's so, your guest. Yeah, I'm you a delegate are, oh, and he's okay. a guest. So yes. what's the process you went through to become so a delegate? So the process is you have to be um, an active member of the GOP in your area. I'm, I currently serve on the executive board in my county for the GOP. And then you have to attend a certain amount of meetings per year. You have to pay your dues, of course. And then you have to go to what's called mass meetings. From there, you go on to um, the county convention, then state convention, and you're nominated. You can be nominated at a county level, a district level, which is your S Congress um, one. I was actually elected from my state, so that we have 31 delegates here representing the state of Georgia. And do you have to do politicking and get support and like absolutely, ask people to? Absolutely. There were 270 people that were nominated, and um, I luckily got to be chosen as one of them. So, so how do you run for something before? Were you one of those kids in school that you were running for school? Uh, <laughs> in college, class president. Was, oh, yeah, okay. All yeah. right. So you already have that personality. So um, tell us a little bit about the journey to Mitt Romney. Were you an early Mitt Romney supporter? No. Okay. No. So, so yeah. So tell us how you got there. Um, it was it was a hard call for me. I had to stay quiet for a while. As one of the things, when you are an official with the GOP, you are not allowed in a primary to say where you stand. And oh. so. Um, I had to really, really study out the candidates. I, I was, I liked a lot of different ones all along the way. I liked, I wanted a little bit of everybody, and I, uh, but I, when it came down to it, united with the party and I'm going with Mitt. Okay, but can, now can you talk about even because he's officially been nominated, yeah. who, yeah. who you actually, who you guys voted for in the primary? I voted for Newt Gingrich in the primary. Oh, yeah. Home okay. state guy, I right? Know, yeah. I mean, right. That's right. Not, and you have to admit, the man is just absolutely intelligent. And so I, I had an opportunity living in Georgia, hearing him speak in person tons of times. And so I was a, I was a big supporter of his. But, I mean, 
Romney hammered Gingrich. I mean, his supporters <laughs> just spent tons of money I know, taking I know. here in Florida. Yeah, the oh primary. yeah. I mean, oh, it was yeah. really, really brutal. And yet here you are casting your vote. For but you know what? We didn't see that in Georgia. We really didn't. Um, Romney didn't spend any money in Georgia. Right. <laughs> so right. he's been it all here. So we, yeah. we actually didn't see that side of it. So so there's a lot of talk amongst people like like us about the enthusiasm gap. Mm -hmm. It seems like from what we can see and hear going on on the floor there, that there's not a sense of like, rah, rah, Mitt, we're so excited, people jumping up and down when he hit that magic number to get the nomination. There's a lot of applause, people were cheering, but it just seems like it's missing a little something. Can you speak to that? Do you feel a little bit about that, that there is an enthusiasm to, to win? To, yeah. beat Mitt Rom uh, to beat Barack Obama, but is there enthusiasm for Mitt Romney? I think there is. I think there is, and I think especially with uh, Paul Ryan being added to the ticket, I think that that has just built the enthusiasm a thousand times. So I do think it was slow to get going. I will admit that, but I, I definitely think that now with the full ticket, I think the enthusiasm is definitely there. So, And I think you'll see it more tonight. You, we definitely only had about half the delegation here for this afternoon, and because a lot of your guests and things don't come for that person. Um, can you tell us about any fun delegate parties that you get to go to? Oh, yeah. Oh. We've had parties all, all week. He likes them more than I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's, what's the best party you've been to? Uh, the welcome party. The, yeah, the, the opening open, party yeah. was great. Tampa did an amazing job. They really showcased Florida. Uh, just really put on a really good party. We had a really fun time. Well, thank you guys so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. Yeah. You give us a perspective Absolutely. that we just don't get elsewhere. So it's really great to hear from you. Absolutely. We, Absolutely. we appreciate you having us. Enjoy the rest of the convention. All right. Thank you. Thank you. As we will do all week long, we also want to make sure we bring you some of what is happening on the convention stage itself. Some speakers uh, that we know you're going to want to hear from. And uh, certainly one of the superstars of the Republican Party right now is the governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker. Uh, he obviously just survived that recall effort in his state after his battle with public employee unions. Um, those protests about a year and a half ago that consumed the state capitol in, in Madison there. Uh, teachers unions specifically uh, he was embattled with. And um, it makes sense, I guess, that he's on the same night as, as Chris Christie. Um, so we want to make sure that we give you some of what uh, Scott Walker has to say tonight as well. Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing about Scott Walker and Chris Christie, they represent states that we think of as traditionally blue states, right? And they have to work with a Democratic legislature. They had to work now, in, in uh, Christie's case, it's much more Democratic than it is for Scott Walker, but to battle the perception, the national perception of what a Republican is. And what they've come what they've really um, succeeded in doing is by hammering home this point of competence. They really are trying to show that that is the way that Republicans can win over those sort of swing voters, those folks who've been Democrats for a long time. It was interesting, David, I was sitting in a focus group of women voters in Milwaukee. Right? These were swing voters. Ten of the women in this room voted for Barack Obama in 2008. Many of them said they, uh, they liked Scott Walker. They liked what he did. They didn't necessarily like how he went about it. They didn't like the fighting part. But they, they, one woman specifically said, look, he was bold. He gave us a path. He said, this is what I'm going to do. He got it done. And she said, you know, I voted for Barack Obama in 2008. He said he was going to get things done, and he hasn't. So that's where Walker really has this crossover appeal. It's not just getting the red meat thrown out to the party base here. He is the kind of candidate that you know that Democrats, I'm sorry, that Republicans are going to want to showcase nationally as somebody who can fundamentally get something done. Which is why, Amy, as you know, a lot of national Democrats uh, did not want the unions That's to sort right. of take on this fight against Scott Walker. That's right. They really did not think that that was the best use of money and energy of the party right now. We turn to our partner in crime, Rick Klein, uh, who is here with us now. And uh, Rick, I saw you come up with a with a board. Oh, here. I did. Yeah, I, I think actually you did. did. I did bring something this for is show our and tell. You Thank you. You brought a prop with you. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> yes, well, of course, as we told you all last night, we have uh, have something new this week. It's called Delegate Bingo. And you can see right here that... Are you kidding me? What? Well, what? he's been here all... Are you 
kidding me? Oh, I got a couple of a couple of marks. Can here. you hand me mine? Uh, how you doing, David? I just want to. Well, uh, we should tell the the audience what we're doing here is we're trying to meet a delegate from all 50 states. Uh, I, I announced yesterday that I was going to win. Now it's clear that I am off to a, a a rollicking start. Hawaii, as a matter of fact, I've already got marked down. I also wore a lay for the picture with the uh, with the the delegate from Hawaii that I met. It, I love the hats. Isn't it great out there? Uh, you know what? See, he does have a little bit of an unfair advantage. I do have a Look at that. Look at that. There. That's me. All right. Look at that. Now, now, How about that? Think, Hang loose. Okay, uh, yeah, now, I think so. Now, if we have mine up there, this is a very rare delegate that I got here. Washington, D.C. Oh, they there have aren't those? many of them. <laughs> yes, 19. There are Only 19, 19 of them. Of them. Yeah. So if you guys can find those nine, maybe those other 18. That's right. Good luck with that one. All right. Mich well, we all live there, so we might know some of them. I <laughs> there mean, you go. Right? That's you and Mr. Washington. There okay. it is. See? Look at that. See, you well got played. that done. District of Columbia. I thought that was quite good. Michigan, I also like. These guys are walking around in the U of M colors in, in football jerseys. In Ger Gerald Ford jerseys, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Oh. They're, they're, they're all wearing Gerald, Gerald Ford jerseys. jerseys. Yep. I did his, not even his, see that. With his number, and number 48. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite something. Hey, guys, I got to say, you're talking to delegates. They're not a lot of Romney folks who are very loud. I, over and over again, people stop you as a reporter. Ron Paul, Ron Paul, Ron Paul. We're going to hear some noise. Scott Walker's getting a lot of noise. Ron Paul gets a lot of noise. Scott Walker, Romney. indeed, has gotten in. He, is, he will throw out some red meat here, I'm sure. He's also one of the party's biggest fundraising requests across the country. State parties really want Scott Walker to come into their states and help them raise money. And you can see here, the crowd is really excited to hear from him. Let's give a listen to what Governor Walker has to say. Double-digit tax increases, billion-dollar budget deficits, and record job loss are moving forward with reforms that lowered the tax burden, balanced the budget, and help small businesses create more jobs. On June 5th, voters in my swing state were asked to decide if they wanted elected officials who measure success by how many people are dependent on the government, or if they wanted leaders who believe success is measured by how many people are not dependent on the government because they control their own destiny in the private sector. On June 5th, Voters in Wisconsin got to determine who was in charge. Was it the big government special interest in Washington or the hardworking taxpayers of our state? The good news is that on June 5th, the hardworking taxpayers won. Just to ask Sandy Breath why that's important. When the economy took a dive a few years ago, she took a pay cut. Not long after that, she lost her job. Today, however, she's working at G3 Industries in Mosinee, Wisconsin. In fact, she just received a promotion. G3 is one of those companies that added jobs during the past year and now has plans to add even more. The owner told me that he's creating additional jobs in Wisconsin because he likes the way we're moving our state forward and he's even more committed since the last election. Without our positive changes, he told me he would not have had the confidence to grow business in Wisconsin. Improving the business climate is not only good for small business owners, it's good for people like Sandy and her family. We need more stories like hers in America because the last couple of years have been, well, pretty tough. Like many places across the country, Wisconsin lost more than 100,000 jobs from 2008 to 2010. Unemployment during that time topped out at over 9 percent. But because of our reforms, Wisconsin has added thousands of new jobs, and our unemployment rate is down from when I first took office. Equally as important, we improved the economic climate for job creators. Today, 94 percent of our employers believe Wisconsin is headed in the right direction. That compares to just 10 percent who thought the same thing just two years ago. Elections have consequences. As was the case in Wisconsin two years ago, too many Americans think our country is headed in the wrong direction. But Mitt Romney understands, like I understand, that people, people, not governments, create jobs. With that in mind, my administration is making it easier for people to create jobs in Wisconsin. 
Our reforms put the hardworking taxpayers back in charge, people like Sandy Breath. Sadly, the federal government seems to be going in the opposite direction. Nationally, we've experienced 42 consecutive months of unemployment above 8 percent. Last month, 44 of the 50 states saw an increase in the unemployment rate. More than 12 million of our fellow citizens are unemployed. We need someone to turn things around in America. That leader is Governor Mitt Romney. <laughs> Mitt Romney turned businesses around in the private sector. He saved the Winter Olympics, and he balanced state budgets without raising taxes in a way that helped the private sector create more jobs. Then, with the announcement of Paul Ryan as his running mate, Governor Romney not only showed that he has the experience and the skill to become president, he showed he has the courage and the passion to be an exceptional president. With this pick, he showed that the R next to his name doesn't just stand for Republican, it stands for reformer. Now more than ever, we need reformers, leaders who think more about the next generation than just the next election. That's what you get. That's what you get from Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. Now, in a few weeks, we will celebrate the 225th anniversary of our federal constitution. Moments like that remind us that what makes America so great, what makes us exceptional, is that throughout our history, in moments of crisis, be they economic or fiscal, military or spiritual, what makes America amazing has been that there have always been men and women of courage who think more about the future of their children and their grandchildren than they did about their own political careers. Let this be one of those moments. Let this be our time in history so that someday, someday we can tell our children and our grandchildren that we were there, that we changed the course of history for the better. Let us tell them that we helped elect Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan to save America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Lane Turner. Well, you know, Scott Walker there giving us an example of, as I said, the things he really wanted to talk about. He talked about unemployment. He talked about jobs. He talked about a woman in his state who found a job thanks to the work that he's done. I think we're going to hear a lot of speeches that focus on that. And, Rick, um, it was quite a short speech, I think, perhaps a sign that... Uh, our first sign, of course, about what it means to lop off a day of a convention. Yeah, they've had to, they've had to cram a lot into here. There's just been an off note to me about about today, and it, it's not just because it's a day late. I just haven't felt the palpable energy for the candidate. I hear lots of people talking about wanting to beat Obama. I don't hear a lot of people saying, I want to go out there and knock some doors down for Mitt Romney. Oh, look, I, and I think that's going to get wiped away once you hear the great speeches and People will get into the into the act, but the moment Ann Romney takes the stage, I right? agree. Yeah. But, but let me tell you, the moment that that Mitt Romney went over the top with the votes from New Jersey, we could have had a conversation right out right down on the House floor. You didn't have the, the jubilant energy, the excitement over that. I I was a little surprised. Are you dissing New Jersey? I think New Jersey's a fine state. It was a good place <laughs> to have spent four years of my life. Uh, but I, I, I even even having it as the state that goes over the top, with all respect to, to, to Governor Christie, I, I, I'm just expecting more yes. energy out there. And it just hasn't had that palpable feel. I think it's the humidity. <laughs> it's the barometric pressure is still weighing down on me. Guys, I, feel I, like I, am, I am torn on this issue, though. I don't know in this environment with, with two-thirds of the country saying we're on the wrong track, with 56% of people disapproving of Barack Obama's handling of the economy, the most important issue, I don't know if the country needs to fall in love and be really excited about well, Mitt Romney. They won't, so we'll test that proposition out. 
David, I've heard you ask the question about 12 times over the last two days, and it's the right one. Given that, why isn't Mitt Romney winning by 20 points or 10 points? And you're exactly right. That's the I'm environment. I'm obsessed with that question. I, 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 I've taken as much, but it is the right question to ask anyone who says it's going to happen. We've heard a lot of your guests here uh, so far, and a lot of delegates say the same thing. Now it's time to turn on the on the Jets. There's, As Jason Chapin said last night, no more excuses here. It's time to start winning this race. There's just no, way, no other reason that he should be not winning given what the fundamentals are. And I think there's probably that angst pours over into what we're talking to delegates about. Well, you know, George earlier, though, made a very good point, and I 100% I agree with this. We all were talking to Republicans a year ago back when Mitt Romney was r trying really hard to win this nomination. We were hearing about Chris Christie Mitch Daniels, the begging of the, you know, other names to get in into this race. Michelle Bachman winning the straw oh, poll, Michelle right? Bachman. I mean, it <laughs> and you talked, there was not one Republican that thought Obama was going to lose, right? This was just sort of like it was a throwaway year. It was a rebuilding year. and We're going to focus on 2016. Now they know they can win. I mean, it still is remarkable that a sitting president is tied with a challenger that nobody knows anything about and who is underwater in his favorability. So that alone should be enough to get people excited about it. I don't think it's, it's that they don't think they can beat Obama. There's something out there that says when he gets there, I don't know that they're convinced that when Mitt Romney gets into the White House, they help elect him into the White House, that he's going to be the Republican they want him to be. Uh, I think that's probably a fair sentiment. I mean, people here are projecting a lot of hopes and expectations on Mitt Romney. He's given them things in his record to like and to obviously not like very much. I'm so intrigued by the, by the pillars of tonight, though. You've been talking about Ann Romney. You've talked about Chris Christie. It seems like there's a, there's a personal and there's a very broad appeal that can happen here. Ann Romney, of course, is about the personality and about meeting this other Mitt Romney. Chris Christie, though, is about the heart of this party and reintroducing the party. So I feel like the person and the party are in for big moments tonight. And I also think, though, and I uh, asked one of the Romney advisors about this earlier today, uh, I, it seems to me a little disjointed. It seems like almost two different nights. Again, maybe being crammed into one, although, you know, the plan was initially that Ann Romney would speak on Monday night, and uh, the television networks were not going to cover that, and so there was a game of chicken going on. And uh, that made more sense to me programmatically in the way that just how different the messages are that we're going to get from Ann Romney and Chris Christie tonight. I'm not sure what the takeaway will be when we all leave the hall tonight. Well, they need you to take away those two very different things. I think if, if Ann Romney sticks to Mitt the man and Chris Christie can, can, can kind of make the case for the party a lot broader than Mitt Romney, then I think it's, it's a successful evening. Obviously, the, their ideal plan was not going to happen because of the way it was spaced. It, it wasn't gonna, they weren't going to get that night, right. even if there, w there wasn't a, a storm barreling up the coast right now. But I feel like they, they knew that in, in crafting tonight and decided, okay, we've got these two really important messages we want to get out there. Let's bookend the night with it. Well, and, you know, when you, when you look at the, the other folks that they're highlighting tonight, and we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of it to have Rick Santorum out there, have some of the other governors out there, you know, they really want to do more than just say, okay, Chris Christie's the one who's going to carry us over the finish line. Really what they want to come away with this night uh, for us to be talking about is the fact that, boy, there are a lot of Republican governors out there. Boy, they have a lot of stuff to say, and they've been able to be successful, and they have high approval ratings, and, well, maybe we can make that same case just nationally. Well, and that's one of the interesting things. There are so many Republican superstars all of a sudden. That's right. They're everywhere around here. But Mitt Romney kind of isn't one of them, even though he just won the nomination. I, I, I don't feel like he has the star power of at least half a dozen governors, a couple of senators. Right. They, they are bigger his, stars. His running mate? His running mate. Yeah, I know. Exactly. It's, it's, it, is, it is remarkable. You do really talk about the farm team here. That 2016 bench is really deep. And then you talk about the Democrats' 2016 bench. Very weak. Right. right? Well, I we mean, there's not, not much out there right now. Well, unless you consider the Secretary of State as a potential person on that 2016 That's fine. Bench. Okay, but that's that's one person yeah, on the bench. Yeah, yeah. And it's also the bench from 20 years ago. I mean, it's a much different way to build it. They yep. have, they, there's they been have an atrophying of that muscle during the Obama years. They, hadn't ha they haven't had to develop that kind of talent. They've had, certainly there's lots of great Democrats, young Democrats, another generation, but uh, you, the opposition is what breeds it you, because they have an opportunity to, to run against someone. That's why we had this new crop of, of governors, of Tea Partiers who are out there. What have you guys been surprised about so far in talking to delegates, Tea Partiers in particular? Do you have a sense that they have, have bought into the Mitt Romney thing, that they see that? You said, Amy, that you feel like they there have expectations for Mitt Romney that maybe aren't realistic. Well, I don't think they don't know what 
they're going to get. You know, and I think that's really the question in their minds. Are they going to get the Mitt Romney from his time in Massachusetts, or are they going to get the Mitt Romney as the candidate he was in the primary? And, you know, we, we talked about this with Senator Hatch, but he's going to go into Congress that is going to be even more unruly than ever. Their approval ratings are now somewhere in the single digits, so they have nothing more to lose. They don't feel chastened at all by these poor approval ratings. And they are... He's going to have to go in there, try to get them to do really tough stuff, I'm, which equals compromise, and that is going to be exceedingly difficult. I, I think what we have seen Speaker Boehner have to do is nothing compared to if Mitt Romney wins the presidency, what he's going to have to do with his own party to get his agenda through. I, I just think that that is going to be an amazingly tough High Wire Act. Rick Klein, thank you so much for being with us. We'll be checking in with you again. Please, no more bingo, like, delegate. Don't go find them now in between. Oh, I'm yeah, I'm yeah. not going to rub it in, well, guys. I, I, I'll, yeah, I'll, you're I'll, not going to I'm going to retire the, the, the sheet for the rest of the <laughs> evening, at least.